Yo. Just need to check that we've got sound coming through, because YouTube says... Uh, yes, I'm in a vest. YouTube says Yo. that we have no... Uh, just need to check we've got sound coming through because YouTube's. Uh, you're going to get a bit of a bit of feedback there, I suspect. So that my cans in. Um, so yes, we should be fine. It looks like it's coming through from what I've seen, and uh, YouTube just doesn't seem to like the music on the countdown. How peculiar! All right, we're not worried. Don't worry. Dunk will be here soon. I'm going to go away, and I'll be wearing a top and have a cup of tea when I come back. Um, so stay tuned, and I'll see you in a minute.
Oh, hold on. Uh, hello. I don't hello. know what that was. That was a funny series of noises, wasn't it? What I just done. <laughs> I, I don't know what I was doing. Uh, look at Duncan and his haircut. He, he was holding off for our film, looking oh, all shaggy. Was. And now he's all... That must be... I, I do remember what it was like. I do remember the sweet relief of a haircut. And, and it was just one of the best feelings ever. Yeah. Like, to, to shake off the mane. Um, Get, get, the, get the short back and sides back. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Well, no, it was very, it was uh, uh, rather pleasant. <laughs> I can imagine. It's yes. a big relief. Um, yes, so I'm using uh, the big, the, remember the huge mains powered key light we had for the film? Yes. Um, I'm using that <laughs> just because I, I can. I'm also using Scott's um, you size silly ones as well. I, 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 appear, I don't know if I've just colour balanced the camera wrongly, but I look suspiciously orange for someone who is me. Um, so yeah, maybe I'm just cooking, I don't know. And I'm using Scott's um, Zeiss Cine Lens as well. Very nice. <laughs> so i got to give the Cine Lens back soon. I was like, fuck it, I'm going to use it for a stream. Why the fuck not? Um, so I didn't get to... Uh, I didn't, you know, I'll do this, I'll do this this week, and then next week's going to be a bit more normal. Also, my overhead light that I normally have, I've just chucked down here because... Something's happened to the thread on my T bar, so it took a it took a plunge and, and took out my escape key and I had to fit a new escape key. Oh yes. And then it had another attempt on my life earlier when I was setting this up. I was like, I don't really want one of those huge you know those chunky batteries that go in them. So yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I could yeah. get brained by one of those fucking things, man. They they just fall out arbitrarily <laughs> though, like like dying pigeons, you know. I, re- I lost uh one or two on the shoot because they got damaged from falling great heights and it's like that could have killed someone. Okay. <laughs> They're so um, bad. They're so shonky, isn't they? and there's such a like. It's an old school design, isn't it? So it's just it's a Sony's camera battery. Yeah, they, I think it, more, it's more the particular lights I have. I think the mounts start to wear out than the batteries uh, themselves because the batteries themselves are fucking amazing. Like I use them to power the camera as well. Like, they're really really good. Mm. Um, so so there you go. So uh, I, 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 Alan Partridge. Alan Partridge. Are, are we get? Is this a thing we're getting out of our system, or is I, this? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to tell um, whether or not <laughs> this is a uh, how well this will do. I don't know. I don't know how um, into this our audience is. It's. I mean, I should think our American audience is largely unaware. Of Alan... well, I don't I know. know. Rob, Rob likes his Alan, doesn't he? Rob likes his Alan Partridge. Yes. Um, I, I, it's on. It's on Prime Video, by the way, everybody. Um, mm. If you have a subscription, it's included. Um, so. So that's that's worth knowing about. Um, yeah, I don't know. I watched it today whilst I was working. I had it in the background. And I've also done a bit of a deep dive on the facts because I know we've done a lot of comedies recently and I don't want it to just be us laughing at a thing. Facts. Um, facts. So, yeah, I've done a bit of a, I've done a bit of, bit of due diligence on this one. Um, and it's just well, very... Done. I think it's very interesting. You know, it's a very interesting thing, I think. I haven't sold that very well, have I? <laughs> I, do, I, I um, yeah, I, I've seen it once. Um, You've and, only seen it once. Yeah. Um, oh. In the, in I do think in the Partridge oeuvre, it doesn't work. It doesn't work as well for me. I think it's it's. I, I think he is translated to most mediums, but that a feature length film, it loses the meta stuff. I think that's the problem. Is it's like everything else you can kind of see as being either a documentary or a real TV show. You know, you buy into the the world of it all, whereas this, it you can't really because it's a sort of film, that, you know, and it has the tropes of a film in places, but it, it sort of, it breaks it, the fourth, well, it just, I don't know, it doesn't, I don't think it translates. I, I've, I've seen this with lots of British comedies that just, they don't, tra- and, and Alan Partridge is fairly porous in terms of the mediums he can, uh, jump between, I think, but uh, this this is, was one too far. I think I don't think it works as well. It's funny, think, but it doesn't. I wonder if this is. Re- I didn't realize you'd only seen it once. I I think it might be worth you watching again properly sometime. Saying um, I'm wrong. Yes, basically. Yeah, I, was, <laughs> I was couching how fucking wrong you are. No, um, I really like it. I think it's really funny. I think you're right about the format because Partridge is th- the interesting thing about Partridge is that it. It works across all these different formats, but this is the one because they've kind of they say that I'm Alan Partridge because I'm a Partridge is a straight sitcom, but they pretend it's kind of like a documentary yeah. when it isn't one because he doesn't address the crew or the camera or anything. But they kind of retroactively in the commentary say like it's a reenactment or something. Mm. Um, yeah, this is a movie. Like I think having watched it, I really enjoyed it today. I've always really liked it. Um, 
And I think it's kind of, I think people who are wrong, like you, are in the minority. No. Um, you know, most people seem to like it. I know people who don't like it really don't like it. And I think the reasons they give are your reasons and they are valid reasons. Um, it's not that I don't like it. I mean, I have a fun time with it, but I think it outstays its welcome. I think once you get past the hour mark, it's very hard to sustain. I just think it's a hard joke to sustain for that amount of time and in that format. You know, when you've got to please a movie going audience, you know, I mean, it'd be one thing if it was like a feature, like, like subsequently, all the stuff like Scissor Dial and all that has done, has worked really well, but it wasn't catering to a film audience, you know, it wasn't catering to people who paid money to go to the cinema. And I think that's part of the problem is the audience it's trying to sort of placate. Um, I, I, that's that, it just, I don't think the character translates into that very well. But, you know, I, it doesn't, I don't, it wouldn't bother me to be wrong, and it's. Uh, I'm, I'm happy that it exists. I'm by no means mad at, at Steve Coogan or anyone. I, I just, you know, it's fine. It's fine. It's, it's, you know, it, and it's fun. It is fun. It's just sort of. I think when it strays into the realms of like later on when you've got Cole Meany holding people at gunpoint and he's running around and it starts to stray into the realm of the, the absurd. That's where I sort of. Because it was always Alan Partridge was always grounded in in some sense of reality, not just uh, reality, but also mundanity. Yes, yeah. That's the, I I think that's the, the so the, this is an issue a lot of people bring up, and it's something that bothers me a bit less. But because I, I do think they, and I think it's really works divisive because I think they do straddle a fine line um, with it. Because you can't have a character, you can't have anything too interesting happen to Alan Partridge because, it, again, it's couched in mundanity. Mm. And I think they temper that by the kind of things they do. Like, because it is held at gunpoint, but it's kind of a guy with a sort of shotgun. It's not like terrorists. It's um, it ends in a low speed chase in a, in a Nakedal radio van. You know, there's a standoff on Chroma Pier. So it's kind of I don't know. You could argue it's trying to have its cake and eat it in that respect. Um, I don't know. But I think it, it does its best to sort of stay couched in mundanity. I think it has a very high hit rate of gags, and maybe that's not a good thing. But I, watching it today, just some of the that I still quote things from. I still say modesty sparring and stuff like that. I still quote stuff from this. And I think that's a sign of a good bit of partridge when you can still yeah quote things I, off of it. Um, I, again, the sort of the the um, the kind of partridge set pieces work. You know, I'm not saying that that's not good but i mean i just think i i think that the it's the type of mundanity as well it's like when you're doing a series or when you're doing even things like scissor dial you can indulge in the kind of yeah the uh, you know i don't know string back gloves and that kind of thing whereas <laughs> like in this it's a bit kind of like that stuff is gone by the by an hour you know so you can't keep leaning in that so it has to escalate but yet we have to have this sort of, and that's such a typical sort of British. It just sort of, I think for me the problem is it descends into a fairly standard British comedy. You know, when anyone, someone hands a sitcom or a sketch show a feature budget, it descends into this like, oh, here's an American thing, but we're going to make it like you know in the in the British mundane. So it's like it's a car chase, but it's in a ice cream truck it's a gun it's a hostage situation but it's a man with a you know shotgun that, what he stole from a farmer or whatever you know it's that sort of and i just kind of go i i it's fine it's fine it's just not i for me it's not what partridge was about necessarily it's sort of um but it's fine i mean it's fine i, I don't want to sound like i hate it or anything, yeah yeah so. no it's just no this is the thing i don't think i, I never th- I never for a moment thought you were like I fucking hate this God and I don't, I don't think I'd know anyone who does like fucking hate it I think it's a fine line I think they straddled a really fine line and you either fall on one side of it or the other and I have to be on the side of the fence from you regards to it because I bought the blu-ray of this and stuff I fucking loved it like nice. um, and I, I saw it in the cinema and everything it has um, local <laughs> what I like as well there are very few films set in our part of the world i.e. East Anglia because <laughs> there are arguably not a huge amount of stories to tell um, and I actually looked up a list. I looked up a list of East Anglia based films earlier, and I was like, okay, I've heard of the theory of everything, and I think Where Eagles Dare, and and but Wicked that's... Witches, of course. You've heard of that. Oh, sure, sure, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, available now on YouTube. <laughs> yeah. um, I was yes. going to say fucking DVD, but that's not what I meant because um, of issues. Uh, yeah, you know. So there's that going for it, and 
Oh, hello. Uh, Winkong Exchange with five pounds. I'm settling in with this for this with a tin of director's bitter and a cup of beans and a crescent of crisps and a hot egg. <laughs> <laughs> That's the good stuff that we come for. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So I don't know. We'll talk about it as we go. I think there's there's, there's interesting pedigree to it as well. I think um, there's a handoff because the stewardship of Partridge has changed from the writer kind of end of things, and mm. that kind of began with Mid Morning Matters, and here. I think this might be. I'm pretty certain it's the last thing Ian Uchi and Peter Bayman contributed to as the Gibbons brothers kind of took over. Okay. Um, so well, we can talk about that <laughs> at great excruciating length. There's something else I wanted you to know about as well, which I found quite funny based on those of you, all three of you that were here for last week's stream, will remember um, Duncan and I's car, Richard Can't See Cars discussion. Um, so I watched quite a lot of material. I watched like ancillary material about this movie and stuff today and just caught up with all that sort of shit. And um, as Al Murray and James King were talking to uh, Ian Itchy about this movie on, on Five Live, and uh, Al Murray referenced something about the footwell. And then uh, Ian Itchy immediately goes like, "That Steve did that because I don't know anything about cars or car terminology. If it's a car thing, it was Steve. And I was like, <laughs> ah, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Another car, another car blind man. Yes. You know. um, just to let you know, so in the paid pal, uh, we have uh, ten pounds from Andrew Capitz as always, and this time he's left a message. He says, "Don't worry, Duncan, I'm not on an automatic payment plan. Keep up the good work, boys." Thank you very oh, much, Andrew. Thank you. Andrew. Logan Howick sends us twenty pounds. Oh, says, Hey guys, hope you all have a wonderful stream tonight. Gonna listen to this at work tomorrow. Can't effing wait. Oh well, Lovely happy work day, Logan. I hope it's all right. I hope you enjoy the the stream, last stream. Um, yeah, I'm I'm, wor I'm worried that this is me missing the balance. And I'm just going to make this irritatingly factual, which I'll try to. <laughs> <laughs> but who's to say? Also, I grossly underestimated the amount of time today, so I had to do everything very quickly. But because I was doing a really elaborate setup, that didn't go well. So I'm still wearing the things I did a workout in, and uh, I've just realised how much I stink. That's me, me for the next three hours. That's you locked in, mate. You're <laughs> yes, not getting out of it. In. I know. I was, I was literally at ten two, still feeding my daughter her bedtime milk and Aww. thinking shit. And I had to get my wife to take over because I hadn't set up or anything. So literally, I jumped on with not even moments to spare because it was basically already gone eight. And uh, so there you are. So I am yeah. ill prepared. Don't all. worry. I got it. I got it, man. I'm all over it. I'm all <laughs> over it. Uh, Ryan has just joined us, Ryan Ricardo. Hey man, good to see you. Good to see you. Um, of course we're doing this because uh, this time with Alan Partridge returns tomorrow, um, which is exciting because the first series of this time was fucking fabulously good. So, uh, well, this is uh, the most, you know... <laughs> was, it, think... was it actually... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> He's got the prop ready, hasn't he? he knows. Yeah. yeah. As you it, said that, smelled... my eyes glanced down. I was like, <laughs> that was not intentional. Uh, Richard and Duncan, you're going to be enjoying this with a couple of lady boys. We should have done the partridge cocktail. I have done it before. I think I said um, the classic lady boy cocktail. Well, it's not even a cocktail, is it? It's three drinks in rapid succession. Yeah, um, it sounds pretty awful. Oh uh, yeah, it was. Yeah, we did it with uh, instead of lager, we did it with director's bitter to make it somehow extra partridge. Uh, we did it on like a camping trip of all things. Actually. <laughs> <laughs> it's fantastic. Um, it's not good for your stomach to have ale, then a gin and tonic, then some Baileys. <laughs> <laughs> Weirdly, I, d I don't know how that how that shakes out, but but there you go. Um, you're not you're not on the sauce tonight, are you? Mm. I don't have any sauce, mate. That's oh. why I've demolished your bottle of Maker's Mark. I'm afraid it's long since gone. Uh, um, I do, I do have a bottle downstairs, but I was in such a rush, I didn't have a chance. No, yeah, I didn't have time to go out and get sauce, so um, no sauce, I'm afraid. Oh, and, oh uh, anybody listening? Uh, I'm I'm part of three streams tonight. To to this week tonight, this week. Two of which are happen how really happened. So you've got we had we had the AMA stream on Tuesday for Patreon three dollars and up public one today and then tomorrow i'm doing the private watch party stream for those of you on the five dollar and above tier so if you want to join in on that tomorrow uh, and you're not part of patreon if you drop five dollars you can come and see me watching a movie the way that works every week or well, every week every month is that we have a pool of movies from youtube so everyone can watch it and then i put it in like a kind of random pick out of a hat generator thing and then we watch whatever movie has lackluster copyright defense on youtube uh, <laughs> 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 so that'll be tomorrow night from seven 
Yeah, from seven. I'm sure I said seven. It's, so yeah, if you want to get in on that, you may. Also, I've updated the credits. A lot of you came in this month, so if you want to see your name up in lights, it's in the creds. I just done them today. Uh, so thank you for your patience. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Chamomile tea today, in case you're wondering. Tea fans. Huh. That's nearly all gone. Oh. <laughs> Gina, calming down. I do, yeah. No caffeine after five. I really need to knock it back to no caffeine after 12. That would be... That's why, yeah, I don't have caffeine. I sometimes have an afternoon tea, but that's it. After lunch. You, you have a cream tea after lunch. You have Scones a cream tea. and jam. Yes. Some cakes and finger sandwiches. <laughs> it's not an afternoon tea. A spread. After lunch. A small spread. <laughs> On the multi tiered. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I quite like <laughs> the idea of someone being. Wasn't there. A... I think I don't want to say this because I've stolen it from someone, but I, say, I swear there was a thing about someone who was addicted to afternoon teas. <laughs> Is that from like a comedy? Someone was like addicted to cream tea? I can't remember where that came from. But, um, uh, Rob Meyer says defending the American partridge angle my thong is made from vulcanized rubber so it won't perish <laughs> uh, yes Mr. HEC that, that's a private watch party for patrons only so five dollars up to you if you if you if you if you are interested and what we're we going to watch is a mystery um, should we get ready to crack on yes we're going to do that uh, yeah. so it's 18 past so if we do it in two minutes does that work for you yeah yeah I'm, I'm... Good to go. I've got it here. Okay. If that pleases the court. <laughs> this light has a remote control and I can't resist playing with it. How bright is too bright? Oh, that's a bit nicer. Let's see what uh, yes, so if you have uh, Amazon Prime, uh, it's included. If you are from one of those foreign countries like Liberia or Laos, you can use a VPN to watch the on the UK. <laughs> We're quite a big Liberian uh, uh, contingent. I looked. Do we? It, it really? Yeah, it's a true fact that I didn't just make up. All the Liberians come on all the time no. saying, "When's your Alan Partridge?" No, no, no one has ever. I don't think anyone is from Liberia. <laughs> you never just, know. Uh, you, you do never know. Now, I do. I question the efficacy of. Um, if you watch those YouTube stats, it shows your heat map on the globe of where people come mm. from and stuff. And it's like, yeah, I'm not sure how well you know that. So I think at times it has said we have a 100% male fan base, which I know is not inaccurate. <laughs> but, <laughs> it's not unlikely, it, no. But it's provably sort of untrue as well. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I don't know about all that kind of stuff. So, um, yeah, get, get your get your copies ready. <laughs> Vote Saxon, as everyone says, cook past Babtridge. Um <laughs> I did see a wonderful. I've seen it before as a poster, but I saw a T-shirt where it's like the London Tube map that has like Shattered Dreams Parkway and Backstabbing Central and stuff. Yeah, 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 <laughs> lovely, yeah nice. lovely bit of stuff. Lovely stuff. I think my brother has like a bloody. Um, I think my brother has a Linton Travel Tavern T-shirt. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's just just extra good stuff. Look, there you go. See, Annalise pops in. It says ninety nine percent exactly. Annalise, there's you. There's Ellie. Um, we did have Rachel, bless her, and a few others, and Z. You know. It's a bit bad that I'm sort of like, here's a list of women that follow us on one hand. But that, that's <laughs> less than 100%. So fuck you, Google Analytics. Is what I'm saying. Uh, I'm well, it makes you wonder like, how much of that, though. Like, cause surely that relies on you having your, your YouTube account or whatever set up to say whether or not you're male or female, isn't it? Precisely, yeah. And you would have, because I think the age thing as well also because unsurprisingly i think we're 18 to 40 ish is our main demographic of age group which is like yeah i get that that seems right um but presumably a a requires that you've put in your age b that you have an account so they know this stuff and c that you've been honest about that um, yeah so you know i don't know i don't know so, right, it's only one pass, so are we good to go right, let's, let's do it let me click on mine i didn't i didn't click on it like like a shit <laughs> uh, <laughs> <Your shit. laughs> give us a second series you shit uh, okay I'm ready funny <laughs> <laughs> and so it begins this it would be great if we did no partridge voices tonight and just talk very seriously about the process of filmmaking that's not going mm. to happen too, too, too late too late uh, so oh, you can count us in please count us in, in in the way you choose to do it that would be lovely okay uh, five four Three, two, one, barrel. <laughs> ah, barrel! <laughs> That's, he never said ever. <laughs> but why not? Distributed, of course, by uh, the French company Studio Anal. 
why I always say Studio K. <laughs> I think every time I've watched a film Studio with you... Studio K, no, no. Every time I watch a film with you, by Studio K, no. We always, always say that. So, 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 I, yeah, I maturely point that out. <laughs> uh, BBC Films, big black cock films, uh, named after the porn genre, <laughs> which, which we all know. Um, I can't do a sex thing about National Lottery, it does not lend itself well. Oh, well, BFI. Big fat. <laughs> Ian. <laughs> <laughs> another genre of pod so I do like this they put the North Norfolk Digital here's the thing with this actually so there, there were attempts to give this a framing device that didn't quite stick um, yeah, right. so it has the North Norfolk Digital thing on it as if it was a film by North Norfolk Digital the yeah. trailer was someone at North Norfolk Digital pitching this film to Alan and Simon and it mm. seems there's some deleted material where it turns out the whole thing was in his head but I kind of think that it the whole it was all a dream thing is worse than sort of having yeah. an over you know if you have an overhyped kind of movie I think um, you know it's so I like this because it's Philip Glass playing over over Norfolk it's great I, I really <laughs> like that the, the, there's some really interesting uh, music choices in this actually um, well yeah you've got Cuddly Toy by Roachford haven't you mm, that's the best yeah <laughs> he's just driving along singing to Cuddly Toy Your fog lights are on there's no fog yeah there's no fog <laughs> he does that in the um, in the instrumental because <laughs> yeah, yeah. he's rocking he's got he, uh, Alan doing a kind of rock out is because well, you know it's the um, what's the uh, isn't it Gary Newman when he's do, he, he's doing the air guitar and then someone knocks on his door and he goes to take it off he goes to yeah, take yeah, his yeah. Like, stuff. It's great. I oh, know it's it's the tax lady's knock on the door, isn't it? And he's like, and he goes to put it down. Like, <laughs> <laughs> that was the menu on the DVD because they'd done a three D yeah. thing of all the things spinning around him. He said, do, 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 do. <laughs> yeah. Is it music for which chameleons? I can't remember which. Yeah, Sorry, I, I think it's music for chameleons. It's a Gary Newman track, isn't it? Uh, I can't remember. I, think a lot, I, I found out today that a hell of a lot of thought goes into what music Alan listens to. And it's something that they argue about and shit. And like in this movie, they it was the last thing they were changing before they handed it off to the distributor was what songs were in it. Because <laughs> they have this kind of constant tug of war about what he's what he's kind of into and stuff, which I find really interesting. Well, it's um, and it's the strange thing between you know because I think I've said this before, <clears throat> some like to when talking about Partridge, but it's that sort of. It, it, <laughs> It's 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 a very similar thing to James Bond in that he's a man defined by his uh, taste and um, purchases more to the point you know what he he clearly buys things that he thinks say something about him but but it's sort of wrong because they don't they say the right you know he thinks they say something else about it you know it's like the whole I'm not driving a mini metro and like <laughs> his love of Lexus in the in the second series which became a big problem for Lexus because. Um, you know, I don't think it did them any favors. In fact, I think I gather they were quite like what that. You know, whoever then, I can't remember what the next car he had was, um, but people were concerned. You know that um, if Alan Partridge drove it, people wouldn't want to drive it. Well, um, it's a similar thing with them um, because you know one of the characters says he's a drummer from Marillion when they're doing the the jingle. Um, mm. That was done on the basis that you know I don't really have an opinion about Marillion, but like the idea with Marillion is they're kind of crap. And um, mm-hmm. even Marillion were like, yeah, we know what people think, but it was cool to be in the Partridge movie in some way. <laughs> <laughs> <It's> like, <okay. laughs> like the, the touches on there kind of. But hey, you know, that's I, I, I thought that was kind of cool. Um, Steve, what happens is he gets he get fired for saying something. I can't remember. No, no. Uh, what, Pat? Is No, um, Pat, Alan. Oh, no, Alan doesn't get fired. Um, so oh. what happens is... A corporate, a big, a big corporate entity have bought up North Norfolk. They're rebranding it, and they've basically decided that either Alan or Pat has to go. And Alan walks into right. the boardroom, real go, walks into the boardroom to do a rousing defence of Pat. Realizes that what's on the block, and then tells them to sack Pat. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, right, right. Just like that. Um, I think some, some, as I pointed out earlier, 
as, or as I speculated earlier, Steve Allen has confirmed that yeah, this is the last time that Ianucci and Bainham worked on Allen. So um, there is a weird handover because I don't know how the Gibbons brothers got involved, but the Gibbons brothers came on with Mid Morning Matters, and I think Mid Morning Matters was the Gibbons brothers, Coogan and Ianucci, and I'm not sure if Bainham was involved in that, but all of them worked on this, and then from this point onwards, it's just Coogan and the Gibbonses, and I don't know because they're kind of similar in age to us, and I don't know how the, oh, this is the tits in his glasses. I only just noticed that. I don't remember that. <laughs> <laughs> wait, keep out. watching because he look he watch this. <laughs> <laughs> you should treasure that that's the oast house presumably though i think in story no no that's not an oast house no no but that's... his oast, i think the joke with the oast house is that his oast house isn't an oast house it's like he's oh, really? called it the oast house but it's blatantly just a shed in his garden rather than but i think he's yeah. supposed to have moved this is the thing i've said this before partridge has this weirdly meticulously maintained continuity and it lives on off screen and things happen that are then kind of given mm. away thrown away detail uh, but again, the gibbons is a kind of similar age shot i think a bit older and they ended up doing mid-morning matters i don't know how they got into it but they clearly because there's been this transitionary period where you had them all working on it together and now you know, Bainham and, and Ian Uchi have sort of gone off and they both do Hollywood stuff now and the Gibbons are doing it with Coogan and they get it so... Because Scissor Dial, uh, what was it? Scissor Dial, what was the other... What, a place in my life. One. This place in my life. Um, yeah. This time, the Oast House stuff and I think the audio books and the books were with the Gibbonses as well and they just clearly get it so much like they've it's it's difficult i think bringing in new writers like that but those guys okay i don't think it's the same as it was but i think they really get it they get what makes this character tick and like oh i, I mean i think oast house is is the best steve allen says it's an oast style house yeah because i think he says in that doesn't he that it's not technically an original oast house but it's been done in yeah, the style of what he's of, but it, he's bullshitting but see, about what it is. on all the like promotional material stuff he is crouched outside an oast outside house. an oast house i guarantee but, you knowing what he's like it's not, not his house. <laughs> it's some random yeah. house in norfolk <laughs> and partridge <laughs> drives this kia <laughs> <laughs> yeah this is uh this is this is great i i, I will say this as well i mean regardless uh where you come down on it or not, it did well in this country, um, as it would do. I think what was lovely about it is that there was just this insane, almost universal goodwill for this. Like, people yeah. wanted it to be good, which is really nice. It was just a complete wave of positivity. Like, people weren't... And there was all all the... Kind of, they did the... Um, they did the... They did the world premiere in Norwich, in Angler Square in Norwich, because they had to, you know... And he turned up in like that blue safari suit for it in character. Yeah, yeah. And all that stuff because the stuff he does in character is insane. Like the way he's able to just kind of bounce off. I realise that like, when he does like Jonathan Ross and whatever, I'm sure it's like mostly scripted and everything. But you know, there are curveballs in chat shows, and I think there's a bunch of stuff he does just in character, and he can just carry it off. It's pretty fucking crazy. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, it's 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 not been quite the sort of level of like Lee Francis, you know, with freaking uh, Keith Lemon, you know that. He seems to have been consumed by that character, which is really weird because it was such an ancillary character in, um, wasn't it, Bo in the USA or something like oh, that? So one does of Keith, I didn't realise Keith Lemon came out of Bo Selector. Yeah, he came out of, I think it was the USA one, and he was just like our character who was like hanging out with Fabio, you know, the model Fabio. Fabio! <laughs> and he would hang out with him. But that was just, it was just a side character, and then it was like, for some reason, that, that stuck, and beca- he became like a... Oh, I didn't become realize. such a brand unto himself, and it's really weird. It's I don't know why. Um, but yeah, Lee Francis, is, I think there was one or two examples of interviews that he did as himself, but most of it's either Avid Merian or or Keith Lemon. I seem um, to remember him appearing as... Yeah, I, I seem to remember him appearing as himself, like in the Bo Selector days. Um, but yeah no it's not someone i really got a good idea of his personality because he's always keith lemon now yeah um, which also had a mo- i think that had a movie the year prior to this i think there was a run of like one year i think it was in between his movie then there was the keith lemon one then there was this um, mrs brown's boys or whatever. fucking mrs brown's boys jesus christ oh i mean i should to be fair to be completely fair i should have also said fucking keith lemon jesus christ <laughs> um, just to be on balance i know we're not the bbc but I just, just just to be on balance um dave clifton lovely to, I, what i do really love this bringing back clave dave clifton 
D- Clave Difton. Clave Difton. Clave Difton from the Parallel Universe. <laughs> Dave Clifton yeah. from the Prime Universe. Mira Allen. <laughs> no. Um, no. Yeah, bringing back Dave Clifton, the the wonderful the wonderful Phil Cornwell. Uh, absolute fucking genius of a man. I, I love him. Um, Simon Green all back as Michael. Geordie Mike. That's because like, these are characters that don't have to really be there, but I'm really glad that they are. Because if you're going to do the movie, um, you know, bring them back. Um, Simon Greenall, who is the voice of the Meerkats on British TV, and also uh, he was for some time, I don't know if he still is, but he was the new voice of the Tesco self-checkouts. Um, <laughs> Who's Simon Greenall? He's he, um, Michael. Michael Geordie, yeah. He does yeah, he's, see, does so much voice work. He does. I, to me, that's a step down. Like, going from Mike the Geordie to fucking, you know, sweet for one, sing that mouth back You do like, that really... far too well. <laughs> it's easy. And then what's the other guy? The fucking... Um... Sergey or whatever. Oh, Mr. Alexander. It's like, come on, you can you do better than that, can't you? Simple. It's you know like, why? Really? Like, is does, that how far S- we've? Simon Greenall does so so much voice. He does. I mean, I hope he stuff. made bank because I'm. I you think, know, man, because like he he does tons like of voice stuff. Now. He's been doing it for like a decade or whatever. I'm sure he got a good deal out of him, you know, because that became a big hit. So good for him, you know. He did uh, this guy called Paul Rose, also known as Mr. Biffo, who's someone I really like, and both James Lance, who was in I'm on the season one, and Simon Greenall both did his pilot Biffo vision. Um, that's the guy right. who's you know I kickstarted this thing with uh, George Lucas and the Pooh and Sting. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that was that's Paul Rose. Um, I mean, you know, uh, compare the market if you are looking to save some money. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Yes. <laughs> yes. Simple. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if Simon Greenall unionises, kicks off, or dies, you can have Duncan. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if, if, if it wants a pay rise. Uh... <laughs> I'll do it for. Well, let me t- tell me what it is first. I'll decide whether or not I'll do it for <laughs> yes. half or two thirds. I'll undercut him. I'll <laughs> I'm prepared to enter into any kind of Dutch auction situation you want to say. Not a Dutch <laughs> oven, a Dutch auction. Um, unless you will make me. If Duncan needs to go to a Dutch oven before getting a multi year meerkat contract, he probably would. I won't speak for you, mate, but I'm just saying. No, well, it depends who, who, was, doing it, who, who was doing the ovening. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> I just knocked a light over laughing at that. <laughs> it's like because it made it sound a little bit like you've got a pre-approved list. It's like let me just pull up my Google sheet. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> whose who's farts I'm prepared to consume? <laughs> well, it'd be Geo Compario from the. Uh, Go well, and, 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 oh right, and um, would it, and it also depends on the the the, the tog of the uh, <laughs> the duvet. <laughs> um, <laughs> as, as, you know, because that would uh, de- yeah. it would denote a certain a degree of breathing. Uh, from... <laughs> Early in my career, I'd bring my own duvet from home. At this point, I'd insist upon a five-star Egyptian cotton linen from feathery from... down <laughs> goose feather from John Lewis. <laughs> and I want it to happen in the Netherlands as well. But I want it dry cleaned afterwards. You know, if you do it outside the Netherlands, it's just called a sparkling bedroom fart. <laughs> <laughs> I've painted myself into a comedy corner now, and I realise there's no way to make that sentence make sense. Because so to... <laughs> I'd have to call it a sparkling oven. It doesn't really make sense. There you go. <laughs> uh, I look. <laughs> See, this is the bit is also where he does the he, he does the Nazi commandant slap to the guy's face with the glove. He's like, oh, "I meant to miss you." <laughs> <He does Yeah>. <laughs> See, there are things. It's that... one of those things where I think I think it, 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 to get comedy this meticulous, you know, because it is all exact. You know, I think it, it, to, to have it come off, it comes off obviously very um, ad libbed and naturalistic in a in a way. Even though he's a ridiculous character, but you know what I mean. Like the, the situation of it all and the characters are all very naturalistic, and the style is very naturalistic. But it's like. Um, it requires a level of precision that's quite impressive, really. I think, you know? yeah, I, we've talked about this before. I think good comedy does, um, and you know, I, like the, I, this is what I find with the kind of Jab Jab Apadal, Jab Apadal, Jab Apadal. Yes. <laughs> Do you remember that thing? Because he announced Avatar at the was it the Oscars or and he kept going Abadar. <laughs> <laughs> And they made like a song, you know, someone took it and made a song out. It's like, yeah, up a door, up a door, up a door. <laughs> anyway. Oh, fuck. Well, 
<laughs> those Apatow movies are really undisciplined. It's like, oh, here's a two and a half hour comedy. It's like, mm, yeah, these aren't funny. Like I found. Whereas this is very, very finely tuned. There's a couple of things that stood out to me today. It was like, um, I know you've talked about like American things, but they said, you know, it's they deliberately avoided making it about. It was never intended to pander to America, so it's not like, so like. In Shaun of the Dead, when the girl comes out of the garden, he says she's drunk, and they deliberately did, didn't say she's pissed because it confused Americans. It's a bit like, why? Why change that? Just fucking it's your own language, whatever. This movie mm. goes out of its way to not use Americanisms to please anybody, so it's like he's sacked, not fired, and they gave a few other examples and stuff. I get the kind of action trope thing um, in it. I but... didn't mean it was it was done to sort of pander to American audiences. What I mean is they took... It's a typical sort of British thing. Like, I like something like Hot Fuzz does, which is sort of take take it and then drag it down to a level of British mundan- uh, mundanity but it's like but I mean like hostage situations do happen have happened in Britain you know what I mean yeah like, it's not as if and car chases have happened in Britain they're not American I think Hot Fuzz is that's Hot Fuzz is Race of Detra isn't it really that's its whole point um, mm. so it kind of it is that's another again I'm sorry I'm just going to refer back to my, my materials from today um, it's another thing they talked about interestingly so um this movie they deliberately avoided doing it's cinematic and it's lit in a certain way and shot in a certain way but they avoided too much elaborate camera stuff because it you know they want to look like a film but not look like tv but if you have too much elaborate kind of artistic camera stuff it detracts from the comedy and it's not really about that so they're trying not to do too much of that type of stuff but also Mm. they were like well we didn't we don't want film references in this and we don't want to recall other movies we don't want to reenact things because that's not the point you know yeah. hot fuzz that's the point of hot fuzz it's not the point of this so there's no point so they were saying like uh like one of our influences making this was dog day afternoon because it's a movie about a pasta situation yeah but but that's that it's not we're not going to have someone walk out in al pacino's costume or copy any shots because why what would be the point well it doesn't serve yeah, the story yeah, yeah, yeah exactly yeah, yeah. Exactly. it doesn't <laughs> <Africa>. serve <laughs> Africa. um the um edward i just said edward mason sent us th- threepens um it says Looking forward to listening tomorrow, guys. Just polished off a bit of crackling and hot floppy bread. And now I'm commencing our abl- oral ablutions with mineral water, swiftly followed by a fox's glassy of mint. <laughs> uh, uh, that never, you know, that kind of stuff always gets me. That tickles my funny bone every time. So that's, I, I, I get into funny because I, I don't think I do a very good Alan Partridge, but I do like i get so stuck in it when i like when i was listening to Oast house i was listening to Oast house on dog walks and stuff over a couple of weeks or whatever it was because it was all on youtube at one point i think it's been taken down now mm. um but i listened to it all in a, in one big hit and i was just like steeped in partridge and to the point where you kind of find yourself saying things like alan partridge like and it's like it's not good i mean it, I, but you know around the house of that it's just like the i do it a lot and there are two types of people there are people who know what you're talking about which is a minority of people not most people know partridge but if it's just like, some random man doing a rubbish <laughs> voice not saying a line from any of the material just doing the voice for no mm. reason in a conversation most people politely laugh and think i'm a bit odd and, then, yeah, then, no, and other that. people kind of like and then you get the kind of other guys who are kind of like dan 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 straight away yeah um but yeah i just anything anything te- i mean i know because it's car stuff for you i love to talk about uh camera shit in a partridge voice it's about because he can, he does actually say one point he, i'm using this sennheiser 1000 headset it's a cracking bit of kit when when, <laughs> when he's got the headgear on it's kind of like oh i prefer some sennheiser headphones whatever um <laughs> again this is the comedy this is the thing that the next generation are going to really hate because we always go on about it this is sort of <laughs> yeah well like, i mean that's i hated it before i even saw it because i had people at school going like to doing it you know, in the playground, or put on the playground, but you know, in the on, on the quad, and, <laughs> on the um, quad. <laughs> and um, and I was kind of like, I was like, I don't get it. This sounds shit. This sounds sort of like, uh, uh, you know, British people are shit or whatever. You know, it was that sort of. I didn't understand it, and then I think I was. It was when I was living with my mate Jimmy, um, and he put it on. I kind of couldn't go anywhere because the beer was there, and um, <laughs> <laughs> and so I watched it, and I was like, "Oh, this is hilarious!" That was the second season of Iron Man and Partridge, I think. And I just, I thought it was the, I thought it was brilliant. I got it, like it clicked with me straight away, and I was like, "Ah, oh, more of this." So yeah, so I then kind of hoovered it all up and thought it was brilliant. Um, 
I think it's nice. Yeah, it's funny. It's funny seeing him put because it's like one thing this sort of does. There's the cavalcade of usual characters and things like Oast House. It's just him. There's no. There's no other voice in it. There's the odd. You hear someone off, you know, in the distance or something occasionally. There's, or someone. Yeah, you know, one or two kind of ancillary things, but it's. Yeah, but generally speaking, it's just him. And actually, when you think about it, like a lot of the material is just him. Sometimes it's like interviewing people. And, and that kind of thing, but it's like it's odd to see him with someone who he's familiar with, but you've never seen before. If that makes sense, like it's it's like to see work colleagues and stuff. Like obviously we know Lynn, um, we know um, yeah, Dave uh, Clifton, Cliff, Johnny Cliff Mike, Davedon. Cliff Davidson, Cliff <laughs> uh, Psychic <laughs> Simon as well. Yeah. No, I see what you mean because this is the thing you have to then expand upon. You have to expand upon the world. I don't. I don't mind that. I think like uh, this is a thing now. North Norfolk Digital has has gone from Alan because he's back at the BBC, you know, um, mm. and he was doing things. Because when he did the stuff for Sky, it was you know in universe as for Sky. That's what I find funny about the fiction of Alan Partridge is because like it is clearly its own thing. But what they really what they go they really want to insinuate that he is part of our reality. So when he does Jonathan Ross like in character or Clive Anderson in character. There's these weird little bleed overs because those... oh, that's but that's what I mean about that's what doesn't work about a film because he because he promoted it as Alan Partridge. It's like well then that means that Alan Partridge was cast in a film about himself. About himself, I know. And well, well this is this is the thing because they they had you know these ideas about a framing device which didn't get used and it's and mm. it's in the trailer. It's kind of like yeah, it's a bit of an outlier because this the existence of this doesn't make sense. I absolutely agree. But yeah. you can say the same about I'm Alan Partridge, and that's one of the best 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 Alan Partridge things. Yeah. Um, this is directed, by the way, by De- Declan Lowney, who is a uh, TV director mostly. He's done movies and stuff after this and a few bits, but he directed a lot of uh, Father Ted. Um, so he did like a bunch of quite a few Father Ted episodes because uh, they're, they're probably what only twenty four in existence or something. It was like four series. And it's British, yeah, but, I, I can't. Well, yeah, there British was there was only there was three series and a Christmas special of Father Ted. Right. So even even the, fewer then. Yeah, and I don't know how many. Uh, probably yeah, like you say, six episodes a season. So yeah, it's like, or series, sorry, fucking season. Um, so yeah, <laughs> yeah it's like so, eighteen. Yeah, yeah. So he, he directed a, a big old chunk of Father Ted. So I think there's a nice kind of, uh, and you know, um, Father Ted writers and writers of poetry stuff. It all intermingles. That's it? the in... that's the Norwich uh, city town hall. That's so I went to university in Norwich and yeah, so the police station is so I literally went round the corner and jumped in. Um, yeah. So, but it's implying that North Norfolk digital, I suppose that I think there is a building officer there. Cause then you go onto, there's the forum, which is the big, that's where like, if you've watched look East and stuff, they are all in the forum, which is a big glass fronted building. And they're all on a mezzanine type floor. Which is what you see in the background if you've ever watched Look East. Yes, I have. Uh, well, of, uh, this film features uh, one of my favourite things in this was they actually use Stuart White, who people who live in the east of England, Stuart White is a mainstay of uh, Look East, BBC's uh, local news magazine program, um, <laughs> and he's actually in a movie that people are all blues people see, and, and in watching the cinema on camera, it's like it's fucking Stuart White on the on a cinema screen. <laughs> like, what's going on? <laughs> but it, it's got that kind of uh, again. It, all poetry stuff has this weird kind of efficacy to it. I love his run in this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this <is> great. Because <laughs> she's um, she's in Line of Duty now, isn't she? Um, oh, is she? <laughs> yeah, which I don't watch, but I, I saw she's in Line of Duty, and I thought that's kind of great because to me she's the copper from this. Um, yeah. Darren Boyd. I'm a big fan of Darren Boyd. Yeah. I think he's a very underrated actor. He, he's done loads of really cool stuff. We discussed um, him in relation to Fortitude, didn't we? we were talking about... Yes, we did. Oh, I forgot about that. Yeah, bloody hell. Yeah, he's great, man. He's a great turn. There was that kind of reviled thing they did about Python, and he played Cleese, and it's kind of, yeah, it makes sense. He looks like kind of right, and he, he did quite a good job, mm. I thought. But um, people really hated that <laughs> that thing, because really. God forbid you touch the holy fucking Pythons. Um, <laughs> which is how, again, increasingly we will, we will treat Partridge as the holy text that you're not allowed to... <laughs> Yeah, it's the unassailable. Yeah, it, when someone does a, a fucking movie about British comedy and they cast whichever fucking YouTuber as Steve Coogan played Alan Partridge, we'll all shit the bed then, won't we? I suppose. Um, yeah. Logan Paul as uh... <laughs> 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 President Logan Paul. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, so what is the uh, I can't remember who said this, but like, and it's a really good observation about modern Partridge stuff, but, and it's particularly the version of the movie. Like, as a younger man, he wanted to be an older man, but as an older man, he wants to be a younger man. And clearly, the current phase of Partridge, he wants to be a sort of Richard Hammond type. He wants to be, a, and he starts using kind of like, kind of what he perceives to be slightly kind of younger slang and stuff like that. And he has a hair a bit like that, and he dresses a bit like that and stuff. Um, yeah, he's moved. Yeah, in the Top Gear analogy, he has moved more from Clarkson into Richard Hammond, I suppose. In that regard, yeah, yeah. he's got the longer hair and the kind of um, and the more kind of country gent aspirational, like lots of barber jackets, flat caps. You know, that, because that's that's what Oast House was about is him sort of trying to embrace that <laughs> that country lifestyle. That sort of you know embrace you know, it and failing as, as he does yeah, in all yeah. things. Yeah, it's just rambling and stuff like that, and it's just like yeah, that's. Um, but yeah, I mean, I yeah, I think I think that's a good observation. I mean, I think basically he always needs to be, as as we all are in a lot of ways. But who he wants to be and who he is have to be incongruous. Like they have to be at odds. Like he can't be, you know, um, it's a short poem. Yes, um, <laughs> it's, it's um, because you know, he didn't he say in like in Oast Tales at one point when he's talking about getting dressed and ready for his date. And stuff, and he sort of he does that whole thing about like I've I've realised I'm a man of a certain age. Uh, I will never be Bond. And he's like, and he's, but he but he talks about like George Lazenby being his favourite James Bond, and I'm like, surely it's Roger Moore. Like it always used to be yes. like safari suits, yeah, yeah. the hair, and the thing of he Roger talks Moore about not Roger. turning up to his sh- chat show. Remember Roger Moore stuck on the roundabout of the Emmy, of, of <laughs> Kirk or whatever. I can't remember what it is. Right, right. But yeah, yeah, you would have thought, and he talks about because it's. Um, the the Bond episode right of the show of of Iron Man and Partridge that's yeah that's a, a yeah and it's one, and right? it's Spy Who Loved Me which is the one he right. reenacts and stuff. so yeah I mean I you know I've always thought thought that and um, you know someone did it there was someone who did a kind of big analogy of how Steve Coogan has kind of seen Alan Partridge in a different light you know and how his his attitude towards Alan has changed over the years and stuff which was quite interesting. Um, largely politically but also in other ways as well that he's kind of he's been more sneering towards alan and his ilk um in in not as but this is what's weird is like because steve coogan does denounce alan as a character um publicly like when he's, but as when he plays him he plays him with a massive degree of earnesty there's no he doesn't sort of i mean obviously yeah we are supposed to sneer and laugh at him in certain ways, but it's like, I have always said this about Alan Partridge. There is a degree of righteousness about him. You know, there's, there was things in like, um, this time there were a few episodes where he really like, there's always a moment, I think in any series or anything where he's like, he's suddenly really righteous. Like he, he hits a strike. Yeah, where he's you like, need actually, his relationship with uh, Jenny and Simon Farnby's character. Like you want him to win mm. that because they're sort of ganging up on him and they're kind of douchebag, you know what I mean? Like because he, the older Alan gets, the more kind of I think he's portrayed as being more humane and like you said, there's elements of righteousness, but he's mm. more he, he he's he's mellowed out because if you watch the older ones, he is he's like a shit, like he's a really like he's still kind of cowardly and a bit and self serving stuff, but like in the older stuff, he's like a straight up shit, like he's a really nasty piece of work. And um, as he yeah. ages, they've made him a bit more kind of human. And people do chill out when they get older. I think a lot of his like, because um, you know he's he's Middle England small C conservative basically is his kind of broad thing. But he old older, more modern Alan earnestly tries to be woke, but doesn't really know what he's talking about. So like, remember on um, on this time, there's a thing where he's harassing the girl. But then he's like, that's actually a boy in drag, so it doesn't count. You know what I mean? So it's like an attempt to appeal to that, but not do a very good job. Because well, he did a red nose. It wasn't this year, but the, the whichever red nose day it was, he did a thing. Did you do you remember that thing when he was going down the street and he kept tripping yes. over? Yes. Yes. And, yeah. and there was what did he say in that? Because he said a, he went on some like massive anti woke diatribe like in the middle of that, yeah. For, for no this is a thing I think because it, it's stuff he does for career reasons and what he actually thinks. Like, I, like again, I, I watched the thing with Coogan today and he was kind of like, there's a combination of things that goes on with Alan Partridge. Like, I really fucking hate Quentin Letts from the Daily Mail. And sometimes I think, what would Quentin Letts say? But other times I think to myself, what's something politically incorrect that I genuinely think that I could never yeah. say, but I can channel through Alan so it's okay? So, like, he, well, yeah. so, so it's a bit of, you know, a bit of this, a bit of that with him, I think. 
Um, yeah. But I, I th- Cole Meany, of course, we should mention the great Cole Meany. Well, I think he fit. I, this is the thing, right? He fits in perfectly here. He plays this role really well. as kind of like he just sort of like knackered old radio DJ. But he is, of course, I think he's here because he's from action movies and so there is like a Sean Port Sean Pertwee similar thing I think Conmini has more to do here obviously Sean Pertwee's role is quite small but um mm. yeah he's great he is really great because he's like Conmini's quite a menacing dude but in this he's sort of a sad sack isn't he like that's his whole kind of thing he's, <laughs> he's like a, a widowed sad sack and you do feel for him as well because this is all fucking Alan's fault like Alan fucking went and got him sacked and I mean clearly poor poor Pat Farrell was on the edge a little bit and he lost his wife and stuff I love with that this the device he's made to hold it <laughs> yeah, yes. he doesn't have to hold it brilliant uh, oh, what do you mean no it's a, it's, it's a dude I mean like I say I, I don't hate this at all I just think it, it doesn't it's the medium it's in that is, is, is out is, is at odds with you know with the character and with you know with what they're trying to say that's for me i just think it doesn't that's what doesn't work about it but you know um, i think it just you, you you kind of touched on earlier but didn't particularly elaborate uh that it's kind of plays it a bit broad as well in its comedy and mm. and you are absolutely correct i think it does because it's going for a bigger audience right so it plays it kind yeah. of broad it doesn't it doesn't mean it's bad like i don't yeah mean sure no of course anything partridge is better than most things you right. know I mean, that's right. so please don't you know misunderstand me but um, I always think I've worked with Cole Meany, but I haven't. <laughs> but my right. my ex's stepdad did in a film called The Hot Potato, which was on the other night, oh, actually. Hey, and I was yeah, watching that. I mean, it was all right with Ray Winston. Um, but um, but I am... I have, I have been cast as a young Kenneth Cranham, who also was in Layer Cake. So I guess that's a sort of degree of separation. No, that'll do. <laughs> that'll, that'll do. do. Let's go with that. Um, yeah. Cole Meany, I'll, I'll do this now, Duncan, to get it out of the way. Of course, played uh, Miles O'Brien on Star Trek Next Generation and then Star Trek Deep Space Nine. And in Star Trek Deep Space Nine, he's kind of a background character on TNG, but when they brought him to DS9, he was a fully fleshed out character. He's one of the best characters in that show. He had, In fact, his char- he had so much heavy work to do as an actor because... He's that you know that one character in the show that always gets constantly tortured and punished. It was him. So like bad <laughs> things happen to O'Brien all the time. Like if he's not if he's not being put in mind jail for the equivalent of fifty years and waking up the next day and everything's fine, but he's still experienced it all. He finds out that he's actually a transporter clone and stuff. Like, he's constant fucking shit like that. Um, this also this movie and it's the only film I could say it about really, but this. Maybe has wonderful use of uh, the Ski Sunday music for a scene of hostage torture. So this is the thing. This way, so uh, yeah, I, I love this in the cinema. Um, I bought it on Blu-ray and stuff, and I've watched it a few times. I know Ivan likes it as well, so we watched it together. A little while since I watched it, um, and I kind of thought to myself because I've had a few people in my ear over the years go kind of like, "Yeah, it's not that good," you know. I'm not, you know, I don't hate it, but I'm, I'm not a fan of it and stuff. And I kind of thought to myself, "Oh, maybe I was kind of wrong about that one." And I chucked it on today, and yeah, I regardless, you know, as a broad strokes comedy, it's just gag, 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 and they're all really good. Like I, I laughed out loud a lot today because just a lot of the writing's so sharp. So, because and as well, like Armando Iannucci and Peter Bainham and Steve Coogan, they wrote some of the, my, one of my some of my favourite ever comedy stuff over the years. And um, Partridge is, is is tangential to Lee and Herring, who are people that I'm a huge fan of and stuff. So I don't know, maybe it appeals to me, but I, I love the the kind of sharpness of it and all the performances and everything. Because um, there's lots of safe hands, I think, in this film. Mm. Um, in that regards, also uh, it was it was lensed by uh, Ben Smithard, who also was a cinematographer on the film Blinded by the Light, which I worked on for a day. So that's my degree oh, of separation go. for uh, for this movie. Thank you Excellent. very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> I found that by accident, but I'm definitely dining out on it. It's kind of like, oh yeah, I probably stood next to the cinematographer of Alpha Papa and didn't realise it whilst I was getting some craft <laughs> fucking burritos or whatever. <laughs> but there you go. Very good. Um, yeah, this is. Oh, I can't remember her name. She's ugh. the one from the in between. Yeah, and she was in Taskmaster uh, as well. She's really fucking good. She's great in this. Um, she was really fun yeah. in Taskmaster as well. 
But um, yeah, th th this has the whole. Uh, I don't think it's this scene, but you know the whole when they're reading out the transcript from the from the radio, and it's like that whole thing about banged up abroad. You haven't seen banged up abroad, <laughs> Farrell. What's banged up abroad, Alan? You seriously haven't seen banged? And he just goes on and on and on. <laughs> Classic for someone not remembering a joke and trying to repeat it. So there you go. People are bringing up Saxondale in the in the comments. I I did watch an episode of that ages ago, um, and thought it was all right, but it just felt sort of partridge light. You know, it wasn't. I think I, I liked it. Yeah, I need to rewatch it. I've only seen the first series. I, I keep meaning to go back and rewatch it. Cause it's probably on iPlayer or something because um, mm. people really like it. And there are other things I was thinking today, like Coogan's Run, which was the Steve Coogan anthology series. Um, so it's a different Coogan character every week. Is I've got the DVD of that actually. Um, it, it's that had like. Do you remember Gareth Cheeseman, the the dearth of a salesman? Do you remember that character? It's uh, kind of the shit. Bag. That's they're a mixed bag because they're different writers, and some of them are written by Patrick Marber and stuff. But the um, yeah, the, the Coogan's Run show is really fucking good, uh, and, and there's six different characters. They kind of cross over a little bit, um, and Dearth of a Salesman is probably my favourite. But they're really really <laughs> funny, um, and there's things like because the. Tony Farino, his Portuguese crooner character, got such a huge push in the media. It was all over Comic Relief. There were singles out, chat show appearances, stuff that never quite stuck, did it? Um, yeah, I don't remember that, really, to be honest. Dude, it, was, it was... They they were, to, to use a, a now dated idiom, they were, they were trying to make fetch happen with Tony Farino. Um, right. And yeah, it, was, it had a whole backstory and stuff. There was a TV special, there was a single... Um, he did it... Uh, help help yourself to my he did a cover of Tom Jones oh, yeah, and yeah, stuff yeah. and I think like Lulu came out and sang with him and shit it was all like really huge there's a lot of Partridge stuff he even called that um, he had a stand up show called Alan Partridge and Less Popular Characters um, <laughs> where he came out and did character bits which was good that was the one where Alan's like a, a self styled life coach um, <laughs> peddling a course called Lessons in Life Management abbreviated to LILM um, <laughs> oh, I think I remember, you remember that. that one. I think, who yeah, am I, so. I? I'm Alan Partridge. Who is Alan Partridge? Answer: I am. <laughs> this is great, <laughs> great circular crap. Um, yeah, that's the the thing they they. And again, it's something that I've kind of observed from sort of just watching stuff and everything. That, Firstly, the character they they constantly change format, so that I think that's what's helped to keep it fresh. There was a dormant period between I'm Alan Partridge and Mid Morning Matters, which was like eight years or something. Um, yeah. There was a huge because P uh, Coogan was doing Hollywood, and I think he kind of lost interest in it, and it seemed like there wouldn't be any. There was kind of I think he fell out of love with Partridge and then came back round to it, from what it sounds like. I think he uh, well, I, yeah, I was got the impression that he sort of started to see it as a bit beneath him, and that he was moving on from it, and that's kind of what the trip leans into a bit yes you know it's yeah you know he's sort of this he, he thinks very highly of himself as an actor and it's like and then rob bryden just gets to undermine it's great it's, the trip is so yeah. wonderful it's so so good yeah um yeah it, well yeah exactly I, I i agree i think he did kind of think it was beneath him but then he'd come it's nice to see him fall back in love with it because it came back so strong because that was it returned mid-morning matters was on youtube it was sponsored by fosters who were making the, the shit lager company who were making loads of comedy at the time and they did they, the fast show revival they did which was was not good um but mid-morning matters was a revelation because again it was supposed to be a webcam in this radio studio and then Tim mm. Key was suddenly in it, and it was so, so, so fucking good. It was just like this is really, really funny. Um, and then this came out of it, and I think just constantly putting him in different formats. So I think dropping him, you know, this time drops him in the kind of asinine BBC One talk show format, and it's the one show, isn't it? Um, yeah, it works so brilliantly. Uh, and I, th I don't know, it's, it's kind of unique. It's not kind of like because if they'd just come back with another series of I'm Alan Partridge set in 2017 or something, I I wouldn't have been all right with that. I'd just be like, no, no, that's not what you do. You keep moving forward. You do something different. And, yeah, know. no, I agree. I don't think um, I think because like you say, all the, the there's all the ephemera as well. Like he's written books, he's done audio book versions of his books. He's got a podcast. He's got there's you know all this stuff is sort of like. Uh, it's, you, you, know, you, you can build the set of Alan Partridge like it is like you say he exists and it's almost as though he's he's sort of moved over into the real world and I do think that th th that's why the film for me is an outlier because it's all it, he works in everything else but when you make a movie it just I like as a format for me it's kind of like well are you saying because at that point you have to say 
this is an entirely fictionalized world or you know this is just a feature length episode of I am Alan Partridge or what what is it you know because everything else has a real purpose but if it's Scissor Dial it's because he's making a documentary about Britain you know if it's um the the host house that's a podcast obviously and he gets to do like all the adverts and stuff for basically him saying you know or audible asked him to do a podcast yeah, you know, constantly like references his leave. agreement with audible throughout host house. <laughs> yeah <laughs> um you know so he can lean into the real world aspects of it because he is a broadcaster that exposes the thing isn't it it's like he's a he's a mundane broadcaster <laughs> and that's the joke whereas when it's like he's a even though I know this isn't sort of this, the purpose and the thrust of this isn't he's a film star now or he's an action star or any of that stuff. He's still him, but it's like what lens are we looking through at? I him? I do agree. I strongly agree to use the vernacular of a survey. I strongly <laughs> agree. <laughs> Five. Strongly agree. Five. Strongly agree. I'm using some kind of my own new speak inspired by surveys. I don't know. Um, I do yeah. five strongly agree. Uh, and I've kind of, as much as I love this, I have always felt that tension at the center of it. It's like, mm. what are we saying here? Because when the trailer came out and it was the guy at North Norfolk talked to him about it, I was kind of like, well, what does that mean though? Um, and they bend that off, I suppose. But yeah, you're absolutely right. I think this is a really sharply written comedy, very funny comedy, nice tight 90 minutes. But what are we saying in it? and why are we seeing this? And is it a film? Because here's the problem I have, and I'm sorry to drill down into this too far, but it's like, I don't think Alan can act this well. So it can't be a movie. And why would anybody make a film about Alan in which he plays himself? Like what? What is it? What is it? There's that. That's yeah. and you know, funny. You should uh, uh, just to sort of drill down further. Um, <clears throat> the they said, as I referenced earlier, they said we didn't we want it to be cinematic, but we didn't want to spend too much time doing kind of big fancy shots and stuff because it detracts from the comedy and it detracts from the mundanity of the situation. I posit that the fun of Alan Partridge changing formats is because it's always really playful with the format. So it's always subversive or play. So like the um, this time has been very very good. At like so, no me no you Alan Partridge. You watch a chat show go a live chat show go wrong in real time. Mm. This time has those bits where it shows you the off air section. So you stay with him when they throw away to a VT or throw away to another presenter. That you stay with him, and it's always yeah. framed through someone's camera that's being adjusted or someone's hot mic. So it's playful and. Yeah. Quite often, like a few of the formats he's done, they're they're playful, like the Oast House thing, like you know, because it's like he's left his recorder and when he's get caught, gets caught in that man's house, and talk, because he's talking about Audible and stuff, and how he's you know he does these ill advised, like you know when he goes to go for a run, he boasts about how good is it running, and then he does about half a mile, nearly collapses, and has to get a lift home, has to get a cab back, <laughs> yeah, he gets an Uber back, back home, and then he argues <laughs> with the Uber driver about where to drop him off, like yeah, you know, where this yeah. doesn't get to do that because you can't. What are we saying? Unless you released like, um, you know, unless you released a film documentary, but then this is a time after The Office. And just for the record, that fucking, I watched for some reason I watched that David Brent film and it was dreadful. It was really bad, oh, in God, my opinion. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's kind of in a post office world, not a post office world. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome oh, well, to post office world. <laughs> um, the, the disappointing. <laughs> Disney Pixar film post office one. Hasn't he gone and had a shower or something? Yeah, yeah, Alan falls asleep and Pat's got, he literally walks in and goes, like, Oh, there's a lot to be said for a hot shower. And then Psychic <laughs> Summer's like, Morning, Alan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is hard. It is, it is, don't get me wrong. Like, I, I mean, I think if you have to make a film of Alan Partridge, I guess this is the way to do it. But it's like, um, like you say, I just I think it's and it's never referenced again, is it? You would think this would be a defining moment in the character's life, right? That he was in part of a siege, and it's like they never reference it in any of the other stuff. You would think in Oast House or something, you would talk I, about. Yeah, it. I wonder if it's in Nomad. It might be Nomad. I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I'm not, yeah, it's funny because they the um the first that because I haven't listened to Nomad, but like uh, I I partridge we need to talk about Alan has a few because he talks about how he killed Force McAllister at the end of No Me Knowing You. And um, he talks about his version of uh, what happens with Jez Maxwell, you know, the stalker guy. Like, Alan's version is way more flattering to him, um, mm. you know, because I think he says, like, 
I think he says that he like karate chops him or something. I can't remember. He kind of bullshits like. Uh... Okay, James says so. The movie is me- is referencing Nomad, the other audio book. Yeah. Okay. Um, so fair enough, but I just yeah I I like I, say, I think I think like you said a big part of Alan Partridge, even though people maybe don't realise it, is how clearly it defines how we're looking at him. I mean, I will say that the I am Alan Partridge um, is probably a bit more vague. Like, it's, it is a bit more like this in that you're kind of not well, sure because they, they, who's filming. Yeah, well, they retroactively say that they're reenactments because they do in-character commentaries. And it's like, that doesn't make any sense at all. Like, don't, why would you reenact these embarrassing things for your life? I think the thing with yeah. I'm Alan Partridge, because I'm Alan Partridge, I think, is probably one of the most successful things. It's probably people's favourite thing. It's the thing that's best remembered, I think. So mm. probably just don't pull at that thread because you I, you could say making it a standard sitcom was one of the most successful things they ever did with it because like a lot of the quotes and stuff come from my man and Partridge. My man and Partridge is amazing, but picking apart what that's meant to be, I think I give it a bit of a pass because it's early on in the process. Because I remember that actually, I tell you what, because I am. Um, I remember Alan Partridge from the. I used to watch the Day to Day, and my dad used to show us on the hour on the radio, which was the precursor. On the hour is what Alan comes from originally, and then they transferred that to the Day to Day. And I remember it was like, oh, because we love Steve Coogan. We all love Steve Coogan uh, in our house. And it was like, oh, uh, the sports presenter from the day to day has got a chat show. What the fuck's that? So we watched it and we're like, oh, this is incredible. And then a few years later, when I'm Alan Partridge came along, like, I never expected it would just be a sitcom. I just thought they would do more no me, no. You know what I mean? It never occurred to me that it would change formats. See, this has, um, <laughs> this has the, the Jasons in it, which is one of my favorite moments. But, um, Jason. Just watch. Have you got your subtitles on? It's, the, it's no, this no. bit. Look, these sort of guys. Look, he's like, <laughs> uh, who are you? <laughs> I'm Jason Statham. I'm Jason Bourne. I'm Jason Argonaut. <laughs> it's Jason and the Argonauts. <laughs> it's got it's a See, that thing there, so the little dream sequence, I would posit that goes along the kind of surrealistic stuff can I lap dance for you? That that calls yeah, back yeah. those kind of those. It, it's it's the inside of Alan's head is a fucking weird place, and we've seen that a few. There's a great. This has a lot of good callbacks. Like there's great little um, great little thrown away gags that come back later. And I can't remember. He accidentally says his safe word earlier on, and I think it's cuttlefish or something like that. And then when he gets woken up, he goes cuttlefish, like that, which shows he was right, dreaming right. about whatever. Um, yeah, yeah. This it's really tight writing in this. It's just whether or not you know it's appropriate for what we're trying to do. I, I think it's all. I think it's all tight writing. You know, I do think. I think all of Partridge is um, is really tightly written. I just think it's the me. You know, it, the, it it owes so much to the medium that it's in, and I just wonder if this. It's not that they don't get it, but I just think this, it's it's it just doesn't. It's it's too incongruous. I think it just doesn't work with who he, with the character, you know, and what they say about him. I think there are ways, you know, uh, in terms of how to properly frame a film of Alan Partridge. It's hard because you don't want it to be just a feature length version of I Am Alan Partridge. But you, you know, if you make it a documentary, well, he's already done that. You know, mm. he, he sort of did that for TV, and it worked really well for TV. But um, for film, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Oh, James Morgan sent us nine nine ninety. Thank you, James. It says, "Evening, gents. I hope you're both well. Quick question: If you had to pick what one, I think you mean which one, Alan moment stands out among the rest for you? Is that because like, okay." There's there's a few there are a few aren't there I mean we quote them endlessly um, I do really love the 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 kind of bank holiday weekend James Bond the James Bond episode of I'm Alan Partridge season two is probably one of my favourite half hours of television ever I love it stop yeah. getting Bond wrong it's like one of my favourite favourite yeah. things no, no that's the one where he gets his next <laughs> Everybody yeah, yeah, hold then, your, yeah. hand to your eye like and this. And then, then Michael ruins it because he, he he puts a parachute out and it's a uni <laughs> Michael, Michael. Michael. <laughs> Frank does that really well. <laughs> Michael, Michael, that's not the beginning; it's the end of the beginning. Clang, 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 
bit. Langer, lang, langer, langer. Nobody does. <laughs> bit of burst too late. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think on a luge, they're a giant luge. Yeah? <laughs> I think James has got a winner of an answer for that question. <laughs> we just yeah. enacted the whole fucking bit for him. Um, that <laughs> yeah. episode is well, because Sarah, mean... Sarah Fenwick is in that episode is a great one and done character. Te- te- text. Text. Oh, yes. My man's yeah, brain. Yeah. Sleep. <laughs> Get off your horse and drink your milk. Yeah, wine and sleep. <laughs> 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 oh fuck also the... he likes American stuff <laughs> <laughs> David Saw's gonna be there um, I like the farmer one with Chris Morris as well and the, uh, you know when they drop the yeah. cow on him and uh, they get Dune McKicken to play his wife and then she buggers off so they like, replace her with a mannequin there's one point where it's just a geezer with a wig on and he turns around to the camera <laughs> well it's the bit at the end as well when he's still he's strapped to the gurney <laughs> and, they win and they've off. got someone else just with his with a um, blazer on, like the sleeve just ha- holding a pipe. He's like, what a way have to a have a good time. time. <laughs> it's just like, they can't yeah. write, put him in the ambulance. <laughs> Which is, uh, uh, yeah, that episode has Simon Pegg and Peter Bainham in. Mm. Um, Simon Pegg did quite a bit of, kind of, when Simon Pegg wasn't Simon Pegg, you know, because uh, he played the Milky Bar Kid, do you remember that? In the um, in one of the comic relief appearances, he's like the former Milky Bar Kid that Alan interviews. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Remember, uh, there's yeah. another one where he's like a, kind of AIDS awareness like gay activist and um and uh, Alan's interviewing him before he speaks to Noel Gallagher. Um and he's kinda of like he goes like pretend for a minute that I, Alan Partridge, am a gay man. <laughs> it's always great. I like the all the stuff about um I've always liked the stuff about Alan questioning his sexuality. Because there's loads of really yeah. fun, like the, the Bangkok chick boys thing. But then, like, I remember that he's dancing with vulcanized rubber. Vulcanized rubber. The thing uh, when he's talking to Simon Pegg's character about, like, he's talking about a hypothetical, hypothetical situation where you have sex with a man, and and how do you have safe sex with a man is supposed to be how. But it's this. He's he's imagined like what they're wearing, and one of them dressed <laughs> as a Native American, and it goes on for far too long. It's, it's <laughs> really. <laughs> <laughs> Michael's shit in a box, amazing. They have to blow up the shit in a box. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and also, uh, when when Alan loses his trousers as well, is great. And he, kind of, he does the tuck, but then that pap comes out behind him. <laughs> and he goes, that's right, look at me. Clicks, and it holds on him. Then he goes out the gate. <laughs> oh, God, I love it. Oh, uh, oh no, I thought it was another super chat. I was still scrolling to the other one. Oh, cry me. Uh, right. Uh, yeah, people talk about Doctor No vocal cords because uh, Peter Bainham has the the voice box. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's... It's, it's weird though because that that doesn't really. That's not what that actually. You know, no. it keeps going. Like, <laughs> the end of it's just like. What? <laughs> I love that because like, Alan's trying to be sort of laddie with them. And then he gets because yeah. they do it where he has his ladyboy drink, and then it, it it does his time skip, and he's leaning on the bar mm. like, Ugh, and it's only been like twenty minutes. <laughs> yeah, I love it. I love the one when he tries to sing to who's the um, who's the woman he, um, Jill, Jill is it that he takes to the owl sanctuary? Oh, well. oh my god! And he does that off key. Yeah, it's, it's that. Why do? <laughs> it's too hard. It's too hard. They <laughs> see they reference that in this because like there's a thing that Alan fancies himself as a bit as a singer, and like so on knowing me, knowing you, he does some musical numbers, of course, and he does them with that. That um, Rebecca Front plays that American singer who keeps calling him Alec. That's Stuart White. Um, mm-hmm. There's a few things because in this, like he kind of takes the lead when they have to compose the jingle for Pat. And there's like that really psycho jingle about how like Gordon Gordon are a bunch of shits or whatever, because um, they have to they have to compose a jingle under duress, which is amazing. <laughs> Did I? Uh... <laughs> he goes like, "You can keep Nailed. Jesus to me. Neil Diamond will always be king of the Jews." <laughs> oh fucking hell. Um, did, did I tell you that uh, I once spoke to Tim Key in the pub because he's from round here? Yeah. Yeah, he's from Histon. Went to Histon, uh, or Histon or Impeton Village College. And um, I just saw him in the pub on Christmas. And I just went over and said hello and had a chat. And I was, because it's Christmas Eve actually. I was kind of like, what are you doing at Cambridge Christmas Eve? He's like, I'm from here. My parents are here. I'm just back, um, back seeing my friends. 
And then my friend saw him and started going like, Psychic Simon, Psychic Simon. So him and his friends had to leave. And I was kind of like, oh, guys, really? Like, don't, don't do that. <laughs> anyway. Don't be that guy. I know. But it's, it's like, why are people like that? Like, I've always been kind of inclined to leave people alone. Unless I could actually think of something really important to say to them. Like, um, uh, so, sorry, your, your coat just fell off your chair. Um, right. Or something useful. I don't think I could. You know, I wouldn't come and bother anyone really. But I, I, I I've had I it. I generally don't because I, I, I don't. People don't want that. They want to be fucking left alone, man. <laughs> yeah. That's, uh... Oh, Frank's here. Yeah. Frank, Frank's here. Right. Sorry, Frank has just written. Michael. 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 I'm glad. I'm glad. To... Oh, uh, Frank and I are going to do a let's play soon. We're just trying to figure out what. Uh, probably punching. A hey, Frank. Um. But yeah, I'm glad Frank's here. It'd be weird if Frank wasn't here for a for a partridge thing. Mm. It'd be weird. I uh, yes, yeah, yes, indeed, yeah, it's... yeah. I've I've got stuck in crowds of people who know me as some bloke off some advert or TV, you know, which is worse really. And that's all they can fucking talk. You know, they get drunk and then that's all they can talk about. And it's like, <sighs> you know, it's like if I go uh, screw fix, uh, and it's like. Okay. <laughs> It, it was tool station. Yeah, it was tool station. <laughs> yeah, let's can we? You know, that gets a bit tiresome. So I can only imagine what it's like if you're, you know, recognisable in that way. I think I, I come from a background of like, because I like to deal with famous people on a professional level. Like uh, when I was at hotels, and like you get in trouble if you stop harassing them. And also, they have just walked in in their fucking tracksuit bottoms. They've had a day at work. They probably need a shit. And want to go and have a piss and a shower. They don't want you sort of going like, because um, you know they're yeah. in a fucking hotel, man. That'd piss me off. Yes. Yeah. Luckily, you know, no one's going to bother me, so that's great. Sits me just fine. Stop getting tool station wrong, says Frank. <laughs> um, fact fans, we talked about doing uh, Mother Russia bleeds, but also the Streets of Rage four DLC is out soon. Uh, but I think yeah, Frank and I think is going to be punching. That's right. I think that's right. Some punching. Um, and Duncan and I will eventually do an Erica Let's Play, which is exciting. So it's going yes. Soon. In fact, I'm just going to have a quick. It's out now on Steam. I think. I, uh, I think it's May sometime. I think I can't remember. I'm going to have a quick look. I do not follow such things. <laughs> I, I, I should. Have a quick I look. should really be. I, I should be. <clears throat> it's right. You know, you always assume that actually any promotional stuff you'll be asked to do. But very rarely are you. Um, probably because no one. Well, it's a couple with the game. It, it, well, and it came out a couple of years ago now as well. I suppose on the. It's big, but it's had these sort of second, third, fourth lives. You know, it's sort of obviously yeah. It came out uh, August twenty nineteen. Is that right? Yeah, twenty August twenty nineteen. You tell me, pal. You're in it. <laughs> and then. Um, yeah, it was on PlayStation for a year, but then they put it on that, what was it, PlayStation Plus, is it? So it was yeah, free so it's, for a month. Yeah, it was free. For... So then I suddenly got like a surge of people. I, I can tell because my Instagram suddenly wakes up and people start liking my stuff. And then it then it came out on iOS, so that then got another kind of rebirth, and now it's coming out on Steam. I don't know what that'll mean in terms of whether or not it's going to find a big audience or not. Well, but... it's yeah, I wonder because you know PC is a huge, huge market, and it might also be a Mac as well. Um, so let's see, twenty mm. fifth of May, we will have uh, this game plans to unlock in approximately three weeks. Oh, uh, you know, it's a real shame. I was hoping there was a price on here, so whatever the price was, I was going to comically pretend it was too much. Um, <laughs> 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 Well, some people did on the because uh, on the iOS app store, um, you can read people's reviews and the, and the negative reviews. The only negative reviews that are on there are people going, "This is ridiculous." I, two minutes in, and it wants me to pay two ninety nine to keep playing, and it's like it does say that on the front. It's like for a whole demo. Game, for a whole game, isn't it? But, like, two, yeah, know. exactly. It's just like in app purchase, and it's like you, but you can play the first ten minutes for free or whatever, what? and it's kind of like. It does does say that it's like so so are they 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 lure you in with their <laughs> fancy words it's like, it, 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 mm. <laughs> like you're being sorry are you being asked to pay for something is that really so bad you know? i have just gone to right. the erica page i have put it on my wish list so i'll get an email when it's out on the 25th of may oh. i will have you know that in the gallery there is a big old pitry or mug on it uh, among the gallery pictures and it says am I in danger and can I help which out of context looks quite weird 
Uh, and I currently have <laughs> that floating directly next to your Skype window for Double Duncan. Um, <laughs> okay. I don't know. I, I did that for my own amusement. Uh, so there you go, guys. It's on Steam. 25th of May. So I've put it down there. I've put it down on my wish list. I have been denying myself, Duncan Casey, Doom Eternal, The Ancient Gods Part 2, the DLC. I've been denying it myself until we have a rough cut of uh, of uh, Touchy Bleed to get all our bits together for people. Uh, and uh, if well, I got to finish it before 25th of May, because I'm fucked if I'm playing your game first. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> Not really. But there Not you go. Really. That's a good way to light a fire under your mouth. Yeah, I got to play. It's been out for ages. I got to play it. Fucking love the last Doom DLC was outstanding. Um, going back to the film briefly, because there was not a lot of film talk last week, but I think we've been on point this week. I, I, don't know. Mm. Um, I really liked the, uh, so I think you see a bit of Lynn's house, the Oast House episode in Lynn's house is so, mm. so good. And it's like a, a, a bit of insight into Lynn's, poor Lynn Benfield's life. Uh, yeah. It's such a great bit of stuff. Um, okay, and we're getting into the... Uh, we're getting into put Alan's trousers coming off. <laughs> this is so good. Uh, so to drink Cor- Corridor Janto, if, either of us, if any of us mug was bumping you, either of you in real life, what's the correct pro- protocol? If one of you bump into me, come and say hi. Some of you have, actually. Um, Just uh, don't approach me from behind. <laughs> don't approach me from behind. No, nah, man, we're normal. It's fine. You just come up and say hi. I, I, I've had a few people come up and say hi before. Um, one, t- two in one day in London once, actually. Um, and so- yeah, I've had a. Um... Sorry. <laughs> 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 and his socks are pulled away. His Pringle socks are pulled away. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I, um, yeah, I've, I've had. I've had people recognise me from various things, but yeah, may- probably mainly YouTube, if I'm honest. I mean, for me, that's all anyone to recognise me from. Uh, like, otherwise, it's school or a broken relationship. <laughs> 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 and those people tend not to engage, so it's fine. <laughs> Fair enough. I, I've had some from our previous life just be like, oh, you're that guy from that guy's channel. And I'm kind of like... If, if you don't know my name, man, it's probably not worth mentioning. You know what I mean? <laughs> so you're that bald yeah. guy. It's like, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know. But um, I found it, yeah, a few since that. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> That's it. And it just, just walks off through the gate as well. It's so good. This is the modesty sparring. No, yeah, I've had a few people come up and say hello, and I, I, always, I always stop a chat, man, because I think it's an immensely lovely, flattering thing to have, because it's such a small community we have. Um, mm. It's really lovely and rare to meet you, meet you all in real life, um, and I, I think it's. I've met Ali a couple of times, and I think um, last I met him at uh, uh, Pimp Shway. But then the second time I was watching, me and Ellie went to see um, Near Dark at the Genesis in London, and he just happened to be there as well. And he, he could hear my fucking voice from across the bar, and he's like, "Oh, is she, man? How you doing?" And he came and rode the bus with us <laughs> and had a chat. He's a he's a good lad. Um, mm. Yeah, Worms T seventeen. I met, met him at Birmingham. Had a good old chat. Um, I met Frank for YouTube, and I've slept on Frank's sofa and got drunk with him many, well, a few times now. Um, yeah, you know. Yeah, no, it's it's. Uh, I I like it. I do I do miss that because we sort of did it <clears throat> a bit more when we were with uh, Oliver. But um, I mean, the trouble is we haven't we. We had planned, I think, wasn't it towards the tail end of 2019? We were sort of looking at trying to get a get together yeah. together. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, well, what happened happened, didn't it? So, but I mean, I would like to get, like to get something where we can kind of get a few people together for a drink. So I think it'd be kind of cool. Uh, um, I agree. I agree. I think, again, it's my fantasy scenario is we get the film finished and we can do it like if I'm early screening for the film and have some drinks that would be amazing um, mm. but let's see because everything's so fucked now because <clears throat> we would have done it by now right we were really keen to do it and everything because um, most of you are in Britain and I think within that most of you are in England um, mm. which is quite disparate because it's you know we probably have to go to London I suppose because we're not even in London but um I mean, we might even, if we did do a screening of the film, they do do screenings at the location. So maybe that could be a thing, because uh, there's quite a lot of events. Yeah, um, yeah, well, I know, I know um, screening rooms and stuff in London 
that I can book out that aren't too expensive. Um, I say that for about 400 quid. <laughs> but, <laughs> I mean, I, but still. Yeah, if we could do it in the museum, know. that'd be lovely because people could come and watch it in the location. And, and halfway mm. through the film, one of us could jump out and go, boo, to make it more scary. <laughs> Dressed as a computer. Or so, I've seen some <laughs> great... Um, I've seen some great Halloween costumes of Alan Partridge's zombie, you know, with his tongues and tip screws oh, yeah, yeah. and, and, and his flex as a <laughs> tail. This is, why is he wearing a cape? It's a flap of skin. <laughs> uh, I am going to go and get. Uh, I'm, I'm just going to go and make a quick beef casserole. No, not really. I'm just going to go fill up my water bottle and I'll pop you up. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. No worries. Uh, right. While he's gone, let's say Pooh and Willy. Um. <laughs> yeah. um Yes, as you know, I'm. I'm a very tired man these days, which doesn't. It's not very really great for entertaining people on the internet. Um, but anyway, uh, what, so it's Steve Allen, right? Duncan, here's a question: How would you tackle a film ver- version of Allen? Would you do it as a documentary went wrong? I think we kind of discussed that already. I mean, I think the problem is is that they've done that on TV and it works really well on t- in the television sort of style. Um. I don't know. I just I don't think the format of a film is is what you know. It just doesn't work as well. I don't know. I don't think I would do it. I don't think I would. I think I would. I would keep it off, or I would. I don't know. I don't know what. I don't know. You're asking me to pull it out my bum, sat here <laughs> watching the film, but um, yeah. I don't know. I don't. Know. How's the family doing? If you don't mind me asking. Yes, they're all well, thank you. Very well. Um, Duncan, what's a format we could do new for Alan? That's a really good question. I mean, I think podcast. I honestly think the podcast is one of, if not the best, venues for Alan Partridge. I think it's such a great vehicle for his sort of inner monologue and stuff. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that that was brilliant. Um, but I mean, in terms of what you would do with it I mean you could do a sort of you could do a, he could do a YouTube channel I mean that would obviously explode that would be brilliant um, but it would be too you know it would it would remove a certain barrier wouldn't it it would make it um, uncommodifiable which I guess wouldn't work but that's really I mean I'm trying to think what other mediums there are to explore that are left to, to explore with him um, because this, this, he's done he's crossed so many but yeah I think that would be a I was just saying to everyone, like what they, um, um, you know, what 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 format could Partridge do next, kind of thing. And I said, well, the only one he's got left really is like a YouTube channel. But then that's really you'd have to do an actual YouTube channel, and then it's kind of well, it, it removes a level of commodifiable. This, you know, you can't. Well, because the podcast was fake, wasn't it? Really, because it was actually an audio yeah. book pretending to be a podcast. So I suppose you could you could do YouTube stuff and and televise it, but it would kind of break the. F- it, dep- it depends how much you're getting into like the verisimilitude of it. Because like, yeah, if you had him recording ropey awkward videos into his into his webcam badly, that would be very funny. But then they would have to be random, uneven lengths, right? They'd have to be like 12 minutes here, 8 minutes there. Where I'd love to see him try and do, because there are certain YouTubers, like I follow, for example, like car YouTubers and stuff, and it would be hilarious to see him try and do that and sort of review a car and do all this kind of thing. But I mean, that's you know, good. you'd have to put it on YouTube. That's the problem, though. Uh, now, here's one. Dan Lars is a good one. Um, Alan does a Skillshare channel. Now, oh, I, yeah. just, I just did... A bunch of Skillshare content for someone, and she she was a florist. She was very very good actually, but because just to frame that, so this uh, this client she owns uh, a, a floristry business. I think that's a word, and she needed Skillshare content, so she hired some videographers in. You know, there's no guidance from Skillshare. You make it and you put it there. So that gives Alan Partridge creation a lot of wiggle room. Because you can have it yeah. done as well or as badly as you like. He's got a bit of money, so he could pay someone well, but he would constantly interfere with it. Like I think the Scissor Isle <laughs> stuff. Oh, was it Scissor or um, Place of My Life had that great thing where he was drowning in the swimming pool, but they'd obviously filmed inserts later of him standing up to his waist. 
So like, yeah, well, that's his, I think it's places in my life. I can't remember. Yeah, yeah, I know. I love really that. clever, Absolutely. really funny bit of stuff. The thing where he takes ecstasy as well. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. And then it, and then he kind of because uh, then they do the interview, he does an interview the next day and he's just like, Ugh, and they've dubbed in like loads <laughs> of uh, audio of his you know stuff over. It. Yeah. Um. So I think the Skillshare one is 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 really good. Um. Yeah, I I don't know. I don't know. I suppose this is a thing that they. they as long as formats continue to exist and change, like they can do something, you know. I really love the in character chat show. He, uh, he did a radio appearance of character with, with Richard Bacon, which is wonderful because Bacon, when he was younger, he used to have real partridgeness to him, but he's, he's kind of doesn't anymore. But like Partridge on Bacon, again, the, the Jonathan Ross one's fantastic. There's Jonathan Ross where he's talking about his sex life. Um, it's mm-hmm. so so good, uh, and then the Cl- the Clive Anderson one's great as well because that was around the time the Bee Gees had stormed off, and Coogan's playing Partridge really kind of testy and suspicious of him. Um, <laughs> it's, it's really really good. Um, so yeah, I don't know, I don't know, I I wouldn't I wouldn't care to say like I, I wouldn't be like um, I I wouldn't dare try and cook up a format for Partridge. I think Dan's Skillshare one is a is a lovely one. I think that that has legs. <laughs> yeah. No, I think that's a great, that's a cracking idea. Um, yeah. Frank T. Allen that, says a, a VR tour around Longstanton Spice Museum. <laughs> 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 One of the most. And we are both. Did you, you didn't used to live in Longstanton, did you? You lived somewhere around there. Didn't uh, you? Yeah, no, I did. I lived oh, in Longstanton Long for a couple. Of years. I thought it was Longstanton. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I've been through Longstanton because it's on the guided busway. Mm-hmm. People of the world, you should know because Longstanton is very close to Cambridge. There is no Spice Museum in Longstanton. Yeah. It's one of the most disappointing things say. you can possibly. And nor is I don't think there's room for a Spice Museum in Longstanton. That's the kind of place that would have a Spice Museum. No, I mean it's Longstanton. For those who don't know, is a very it's an old village in Cambridge. It has its own church. I think it has two churches actually, but um, it's one of those sort of like drive through villages where nothing much happens um, this is called scandal in the chat I love it there's no <laughs> there's no spice <laughs> no there isn't um, and it's kind of being built around now with lots of housing estates and stuff so it's quite dull but it's just it's a it's a funny name I think is why there's a lot of there is a lot of in all Alan Partridge things pretty I'm Alan Partridge I think they've pointed it because these are these are essentially yeah, Ian Itchy's from Scotland, uh, Coogan's from Manchester, but they're basically London comedians taking the piss out of the east of England. Because <laughs> the whole yeah. thing being set in Norwich is all based around the perceived, the correctly perceived mundanity of, of, of the east of England. Because we're not really, we're not really famous for anything other than like some university shit. And, you know, we don't. We, and there's some well Cambridge, I suppose, but there's it's it's in fact as well that it's a very it's flat like it's notoriously flat yeah you know, there's no hill it's there's flat. very little and it's quite topography. disparate as well there are, there yeah. are a few cities that are quite spread out because you know i do find that's the forum sorry uh, this big this big bugger here yeah they've just been past it there's a big glass fronted building that's uh, okay yeah uh, also that that you know that you see the the radio norwich van I'm mm. certain, I'm all but certain that A, that's a genuine 80s logo and B, the Radio Cambridgeshire one was the same. Oh, really? I'm certain, yeah, I'm certain of it. Back in the day, people were kind of like, wow, Richard, make love to me. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, there's a lot of, there's a lot of just, I think they found places with funny names on maps. You know, they found kind of East Anglian places with, with, with they thought have funny names on maps. And they've put well, it's in. the guy, it's the announcer guy, isn't it? In the more like Spixworth, Spixworth, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thetford Forest, <laughs> like, uh, uh, yeah. Thetford Forest is cracking for a bit of mountain biking and a nice walk. Um, the, the, yeah, the actual forest is very nice. Thetford itself is. A <laughs> I'm not even. Yeah. I'm not even going to go and go into bat for Thetford. It is a shitter, but it is where they filmed Dad's Army, which I'm a big fan of, and there is a Captain Mannering statue there. Them's the facts. Oh, well. Yeah. It's not all bad, then. Not all bad. I do. I, all g- bad. I genuinely, and ironically, really love Dad's Army. I think I said before. Now that oh, God, that's a good. Now that's a thing worth talking about. So, the recent ish, I think it's safe to say the recent Dad's Army film because the original Dad's Army film was like forty years ago. So people <laughs> yeah. know when I say. So the 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 most recent and Dad's Army as well. Like 
the, the very famous, you know, don't tell him Pike thing with the German spy, etc. And there are things blowing up and stuff every now and then. But Dad's Army, a lot of the humour derives from the mundanity of it because these are people that are never going to see war for whatever reason. And that's the that's the tension at the heart of Dad's Army. It's the point. And mm. um, the Dad's Army movie, which was wonderfully cast, ends with a massive shootout with a submarine on a beach and a big action finale. And it's like, no, this is Dad's army. Like, this is absolutely not... Like, if if they made a modern film of Steptoe and Son and it was directed by John Woo and the, end, the ending was like a high-octane shootout in their scrapyard... Yeah, I'd have a problem with that because that's not what Steptoe and Steptoe and Sons about being trapped in a purgatorial existence. It's not about you know mm. nickel plated berettas, and I don't think <laughs> the the this is by, by notional fucking Steptoe and Son movie. But I don't think Dad's Army needs a big submarine shootout at the end. It's a fucking Dad's Army movie. No. What are you doing? And I think that's the problem with, and it's what you've identified really with this is that the problem. And I think they kind of knowingly do a mundane version of it and etc but like turning things into films i think people mistake being cinematic with having action and they're not really the same thing yeah yeah Yeah, i would agree with that i mean i think you you could make i mean there's a case to be made for simply making a feature length thing of alan partridge shot cinematically but not trying to you know, which is kind of what this is. I mean, I will give it that. I do think this is that is essentially what this is. But yeah, stuff like this. I remember when he's like in the toilet. It's like, well, how the fuck did he, he get? He tells in there? you like, he undid a, he undid a stainless steel plate. It's in these. He says, Duncan. <laughs> okay. so, yeah, it doesn't make any sense, but he does say, and it's kind of like that's basically a magic trick. I did. It's, yeah, I, I what I watched this earlier is up until Pat takes his trousers off. I was quite, he doesn't actually shit on him, does he? And he doesn't. Thankfully, in the German version, he does. In fact, that's all. It's all the German version is. <laughs> Alan, <laughs> Alan Partridge, Scheiser Pupu. Like, do you know? I this is some. This is a character. Sorry, Jim. This is a character. A character Duncan invented a character called called <laughs> Metal Clank. <laughs> 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 oh yeah, he's not German. He's... Oh, well, yeah, no, he's not. He's like Dutch or no. something or Swiss. He's, 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 he's called Heute van der Papenkweef. <laughs> and unbeknownst to you, I've been walking around the house a week just, <laughs> just saying Heute van der Papenkweef and just laughing <laughs> all week. And I don't know why, because it was in that fucking Upward video. And I don't know why. I oh, know I do know why it is. It's because I put a split diop- I put a fake split diopter shot in our movie. <laughs> and diop- a, hey, my son can't come to call to, to school today. He's got a split diopter, and and, <laughs> and, then, and then that turns into Hoiter van der Parpenkrim. Hoiter, my name is Hoiter van der Parpenkrim. <laughs> It's got to be. It's got to be said like sort of dead straight pan, like you never considered. Not that, even you know. this van der Parpenkrim. and Parpenkrim. Unbeknownst yeah. that thing you once said to me two years ago just was in my head this week and I was just like making <laughs> cups of tea going away to run a purple grip. Yeah, but I do that as well though. I, I, that's, I invent little things like that that I then do is repeat ad nauseum and I sort of have to remind myself that the whole world isn't in on it. <laughs> so like it's like, and I'll be doing it to the dog or whatever. And like, no, people don't understand. I mean, that sort of stuff has kind of taken a bit of a. It has been a bit. Um, I haven't been doing it as much since like lockdown and everything because my uh, <laughs> I've not been alone as much. Tell me about <laughs> it, of man. Because I've been, it's been working at home for like over a year now, and before it was just me editing video, like <laughs> singing the Mickey Mouse theme tune as Pierce Brosnan. And start all day like just shit like that. Yeah. Oh god. Yeah. So I mean, yeah. But that's that is this, this is what happens. It's the devil makes work for <laughs> idle hands. Or... Idle brains in this case, I suppose. Yeah. But uh, yeah. yeah. So I, ho- I have to stop myself when I'm out and about as well from doing it. You know. So like... <laughs> where is this? Is this Chroma? What period? <clears throat> oh, it's Chroma. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um. <laughs> so the, so Jordy Michael jumps off the pier and yeah. it says at the end of the film you know uh, he 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 was never found he was never seen again and then one of the books backs that up and says like he's been legally declared dead so like, oh, this is weirdly because someone once i can't remember who this was because i tried to find evidence of this today and i can't 
And I saw some. Someone told me that Simon Greenall and Steve Coogan don't get on, which I can't find any evidence of. And I saw some footage of them working together. There was some really lovely footage of him. There's a collection of stories about him, um, about Alan, Lynn, and Michael, and how they put those characters together. And Simon Greenall and Steve Coogan were really cracking each other up, like having a good old time. Mm. So I was kind of like, maybe that's not true. but I was wondering because I heard I, that, and then he just dis like this. He just says he's gone forever at the end. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I suppose when you think of everything of Partridge that's come out since this, it's like where would you put him? I guess. Like, yeah. I guess you'd find a way to. Him, <laughs> yeah, yeah. this is so kind of final, though, isn't it? It's so kind of. Uh... It's just like he literally killed himself, and that no one cared either. Like... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I love that's one. Of, I love that as well because he goes like. Yeah, Pat, look at this! It just chops off and then goes, and then they just carry on because it's the worst plan ever. It's just a distraction. <laughs> so you just never know what his plan really was. Oh, oh there you go. Coogan and Greenall were old mates at drama school, and Greenall did all the voices on Mid Morning Matters after this, says Joe Zanks. And there you go. So that's. There you go. There you go. Yeah. yeah. They're old friends. Good, good. Because someone somewhere told me that, and I was kind of like, I don't, I'm not sure I believe that. And I've. Luckily, I've. That's a thing I'm very glad to have had dis- dispelled. Cause that's uh, yeah. it's very rare that do you know what, I I don't I think I think it's very rare that people really hate each other on start. I mean I I'm trying to think. I mean I'm sure it does happen. It does occur, but um... well it's, it's, they're not fucking Simon and Garfunkel. You know what I mean? <laughs> like what's this, this thing they can? Oh yeah, they hate each other. <laughs> 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 People hated Charlto Copley on Maleficent. I remember that. Yeah, <laughs> but I that was so. just generally everyone. But that was was that <laughs> just like diva-ish kind of behaviour? Yeah, I mean, I didn't see it. I'm, you know, this is totally dead. But a lot of the crew I would chat to were like, "Oh, he's such a pet. He won't come out of his trailer. He doesn't do like he doesn't take direction. He keeps like, which is weird because I kind of think, well, he came up from he was someone who started his own. Did he start his own? What? Broadcast company. I or think him, him, him and broad, like, like his, his relationship with Blomkamp is that he was kind of producing and putting stuff together. Like that was a thing. Yeah, yeah. he was kind of behind the scenes in it. And for someone to have a massive, unlikely success, you would think they would perhaps be a bit more humble about it. I, yeah, I don't know. But so, so I can't, I can't speak to the efficacy of. I, I don't know that um, that that was all true or not. But um, I do know that. I can't remember. I think Angelina Jolie had T-shirts made with like "fuck Charlotte." Wow, on them. Jesus Christ! But, but and the crew all wore them like on the last day. But I think that the idea was that that was a tongue, you know it was the idea was that it was he was in on the joke. Like it wasn't that it wasn't a genuine like I want you to fucking die. Kind of thing. It was just like a here's a joke to put on. I think was the idea so that everyone was wearing them when he came in. Right, which implies that they got on he she was just taking the piss yeah yeah, I, yeah. I mean that's pretty extreme isn't it if you don't get on to like, um... <laughs> yeah you'd be that's quite vindictive angelina <laughs> i used to have a i used to have a thing on my wall at uni that, that i cut out of mix mag which was uh so keith flint said something about uh bjork uh keith mm-hmm. flint from the project and bjork was uh goldie's missus at the time and goldie just had a t-shirt that has a picture of Ke- a picture of keith flint that just said cunt face on it um, and I'm a fan of both Keith Flint and Goldie, um, and that was like this kind of anti crossover. So I had it on my on my kind of dorm wall at uni. It was a picture of Goldie in a t shirt that said "cunt face" on it. Because I think I think putting someone's face on a t shirt with a thing like that is pretty out there as a, as a, as a yeah. statement, you know. It's one way to get laid, I guess. <laughs> It's my heart. I love the way Lynn goes to close his eyes. That's a very telling. <laughs> yeah. there's, there's these odd little moments of like Lynn, it, it, you know, exacting, you know, it's like the knifey stab thing. So like, oh, I look like you kind of enjoyed that. <laughs> or it was like there's a there's the odd moment of like yeah. She um, she in in this time she had a whole kind of Lady Macbeth thing going on, didn't she? She was like in his ear yeah. all the time. It was great. Uh, Peter Carlier or Carlier there goes gives four pounds of your English 99. Hi guys, I'm a man down with the reaction to COVID vaccine. Oh dude, I hope you're alright. But listening to the watch party is definitely a good bit of medicine. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. I hope this has been been a nice one. Um, We've had a run. Sorry to hear that. Yeah, very sorry to hear that. Neither of us have been stuck yet, but I know my bro had a reaction as well, but it seems it's quite... 
Yeah, my wife, my wife had a sort of sore arm and a, a day of feeling a bit ropey, but that, that was all. She didn't, she didn't have a bad reaction. Um, so I think she had the Pfizer jab. I think, I can't remember. Mm. Um, but um, yeah, I had a, I had a, I had a, I was a man down after my rabies vaccine. From went abroad only for a day. Oh, just yeah. felt like shit for a day. Yeah, I just felt ropey as fuck for a day. So I had to have a, I had to have all kinds of jabs on it in South America. I love the fucking the rabies one. It was like because like, you don't have to have the rabies one. Like you don't have to have the rabies one. And like, oh, and and when because I went to GP for the consultation, it was kind of like, I say, this is your option, and he's kind of like, yeah, the rabies one's kind of optional. And I was like, what do you mean kind of optional? And he just goes to me, can you run faster than a dog? <laughs> and I was like, well, no. <laughs> and he's like, well, I have that then. And I was like, okay, I I appreciate the logic that's gone into this because you're not okay because you're basically saying don't get bitten by a dog. <laughs> it's like, okay, all right. <laughs> Thanks, Doc. <laughs> Oh fuck! Uh, one of my doctors, I think it might have been that one, has just been struck off for sexual harassment. Yeah. It was the paper today. That I saw my GP's face on the fucking Jeez. yeah, man. I was just like, you know, there are a few people at that practice, but I was kind of like, oh shit, ropey. Did you do the cough test <laughs> every routinely. time? He used to come to my house and yeah. So like, oh, I, I wasn't expecting you. It's like yeah, well, I just have to be sure. Get, get him out. <laughs> uh, Mark Flanagan, five US dollary dues. Brits make a lot of movies based on TV series, but most, like this one, don't travel to the US. Which would you consider best and which worst? TV, British TV... This is probably one of the best... Like, sitcom translations, I think this is probably one of the best. Um, Because I think... Because Borat, technically, is... Ben Benfield acknowledges that she developed (laughs) ideas above her station. Alan considers the matter closed. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Emergency services called off the search for Michael the Geordie after almost 45 <laughs> minutes. After almost 45 minutes. Um, so what, there's this. Like, I really rate this. Uh, Borat, technically, is an the adaptation. League of, League of Gentlemen one's quite yeah. good. I, I was a bit League of Gentlemen the other really day. Good. Wasn't I about that? Well, I didn't mean it, because it's kind of... I mean, it's not, again, it's not it's not groundbreaking or anything, but it is, I think it's, I think it, it, it gets away with it. I think Borat, yeah, like you say, Borat works. As a, no, I was never mad about the Ali G one. Um, I don't think I saw it. it yeah. it's, it's not good. The League of Gentlemen one, I, I mean, I've not, been a bit tepid about, but it actually is quite funny and quite clever. And technically not a sitcom. Did he ask if it was a? Did he say sitcom? no TV? He did oh, no, just say TV. Theory. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah I, I would say League of Gentlemen and this and Borat probably are the because then they got your fucking. The ones I, I haven't seen Mrs. Brown's Boys. I haven't seen Keith Lemon film. I have no intention of doing so. Um, we put Kevin and Perry on for a laugh, but I've never seen it because even at the time I thought it looked dreadful. Um, oh, people talk about the Porridge movie's good. That's come up a lot. Yeah, I like the Porridge movie. Um, Did that go to the States, though? Isn't that what you was... Well, this is the thing. It's hard to tell, though, with this stuff because, like, Alan Park, this in this is this is a great example of this. It's so, oh, I really like the first, the first in between this movie is fantastic. I really like it. The second one I don't like at all, but the first oh, yeah. one I really, really like. Um, hmm. the, something such as this. Would be obviously a big, a big marketing push here. All of these sitcom things, but they would come out as like a limited release in the states. They would be like a kind of art house thing almost. It would be like a little foreign movie. It wouldn't be because like um, I remember my pal Steve telling me that Hot Fuzz was like this little foreign art house film in the states when it came out. It just kind of blew up. It just got wider distribution because it did really well in its first run. Um, mm. But like something like this because it doesn't have the truck over there. Alan Partridge is popular among American comedians, but not general audiences um, in the states. So, okay. yeah, it, it depends on because, like, you know, Shaun of the Dead, that trilogy built off the back of um, Spaced, but it wasn't a Spaced movie. And also, those films were very much dealing with American film tropes, which is why they probably did so well over there because they were, it had a, they, they, they're very, very British, but they're dealing with <laughs> American things. So you can see, oh yeah, the fucking Ab Fab movie that happened, didn't it? Surprisingly recently. Yeah, yeah. When was that? When did that come out? I can't remember. Like twenty seventeen. I was going to say, yeah, something. like in the because I think it, I think it's on Star. You know, the I saw it on mm. and streaming service the other day, and I was like, really? Um, but yeah, that came out because the sh- 
the show ended years ago, but they kept doing those specials, and then they did that movie like way far late. So the, there's the trip as well, but that wasn't an adaptation or anything. But that was that because that was kind of because Michael Winterbottom did those, and that was originally kind of released as a movie, but then. I think they just had extended footage into a TV show. I don't know. I don't know. What's that? The trip. The trip. Not yeah. The... the Steve Coogan Rob Brydon one. Oh. Because that. Oh, okay. That a, yeah, it? they had like a cinema release, as so I think it was just an edited down version of the episodes or something. Oh, right. Um, That's weird. I think. Um, I really love the, the trip's great. I love. It's a really nice, you know, really nice version of those guys' relationship, and I think the tensions they it's... have and everything. It's lovely. I think it's the first one where they stay in the trough of Boland. They go up to um, Lancaster, and, and um, I've been there. Like the trough of Boland is uh, my one of my best friends used to be at university at Lancaster, and you can drive from Lancaster through the trough of Boland. You get to the um, uh, what's it called? What's the the inn at Whitewell or Whitwell, or whatever, which is where they stay. Mm. You know, in that mm-hmm. that episode. Um, so yeah, I've been there for dinner and stuff. It's really nice. Mm. Uh, but yeah, that was that was a sort of way in but yeah no that the it's way because he stands in that there's like a that it overlooks like it's got an amazing view out the back of it and he stands out that in the morning he stands at the back and goes oh yes, yeah, 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 because he likes to get, gets it out doesn't he yeah yeah uh, steve allen um, and frank have just said in the loop which is the movie version of uh the thick of it oh uh, yeah I think which yeah, is yeah. which is very appropriate because it's a oh, my doing itchy thing um it's got james gandolfini it in it does and, and peter capaldi like that's one of the matchups a probably that that's a matchup i never i didn't know i needed firstly peter capaldi and jace gabafini is amazing and secondly we'll <laughs> never get again you know uh, mm. in the loop's crap i really love because in the loop got truck in the states and stuff in the loop's really weird because peter capaldi's playing malcolm tucker but all the other returning characters all the other returning characters are not playing the, the returning actors are not playing the same characters yeah really yeah i remember weird. that being really like it's odd it's a weird sort of yeah didn't didn't tie up Probably, but yeah, I it know. doesn't matter that ultimately, does it? I think it doesn't matter when you watch it. It doesn't matter, but um, there are so many great Malcolm Malcolm Tucker's just one of the greatest fictional Scots ever created. Um, <laughs> it's just, I'm excited to see. I, I never really saw the series. I saw bits of it, but I never really saw the it, whole thing. It holds up. It's worth going and watching on Netflix. It's fucking great. It's so good, and it's such a wonderful assassination of the New Labour era. Like uh, mm. such a because you know he's basically Alice it's spin, isn't it? yeah it's all about spin yeah, and it's yeah. all about how tightly controlled everything was and you know everybody had a pager and like you'd have these forces of nature tear through different fucking departments and stuff it's just this wonderfully observed bit of satire, um, mm. but yeah no it, yeah, Peter Pete Capaldi is so so good as Malcolm Tucker um, and if you liked in the loop you'll like the thick of it mm. um, yeah yeah it's it's cool it's a, it's a really good show. Um, and again, uh, you know, I love. We, well, we're both fans of Ian Itchy, man, aren't we? And um, Ian, Itchy, Ian Itchy shows come up when we were doing Touchy Bleed a little bit, which was nice. But, um, For sure, yeah. Yeah, because yeah. he's uh, They basically took the entire creative team from the thick of it to the States to make Veep. Um, and then he's got that thing, Ian Itchy's most recent thing, that thing with Hugh Laurie about set on the cruise ship in space. That was an Ian Itchy thing. Oh um, yeah, yeah. There's yeah. that movie adaptation right. of David Copperfield that came out. Um, I need to still watch Death of Stalin. That looks fucking brilliant. I need to read. Oh, it is. Yeah, no, it's. Um, I've got it uh, on. You can. Well, if it's uh, not on it's a on Netflix, it's, it's on Netflix. It's on Netflix. Oh, is it still on Netflix? It. It's fucking good. Yeah, no, it is. It is hilarious. Um, I really want to see. Jay- <laughs> I've just seen a few clips of Jason Isaacs. Cause he plays it as Yorkshire, doesn't he? He plays his character as like a Yorkshire. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this is fucking great. Um, and um, what's the guy? Oh, the guy from Homeland who plays the kind of impetulant. Is he Stalin's son or whatever? I can't remember. Oh, I don't know. I have to watch it again. But he's fucking hilarious as well. Like he just keeps firing his gun off like <laughs> randomly. <laughs> it's uh, it's yeah, no, it's it's worth yeah. It's definitely worth checking out. Yeah, because they all basically all fall like the whole cabinet just falls apart and descends into utter like. Is that, that was a graphic chaos. novel, you know? Oh, was I it? mean, it was also a real event, but it was a graphic novel. Yeah. So that's yeah, that's based on a graphic novel that um, or a comic about that that movie. That's one of those ones. Death of Stalin is a great example of a thing that I do, which is kind of like that's a film I definitely have to see in the cinema. Oh no, I've missed it. I'll get the DVD. Oh no, I've missed it. I'll wait till it's come on streaming. Oh, it's on streaming. I just won't watch it for three years. 
Is, yeah, I do that as well. Movie. Like when a film is like, oh yeah, I must watch that. Whenever someone says that, like you know, I get into a whole. You you haven't seen Bad Boys Two, and then so I I go, yeah, right, yes, you're right. I must watch that. I must watch that. I must watch that. And then when it's like presented to me on a platter, <laughs> like I could be sat. <laughs> so at, I've had this before as well. Like especially back in the day, like before my wife went out or something of a night, and I sat down. And I'm like, what am I going to watch now? What am I going to do? I've got the, the night's young. I've got got it to myself. I've got a fresh beer in the in hand. Um, <laughs> what will I watch? Put Predator on again. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh god! I used to have this thing. I was telling Bill about it actually. About um, that I had. Uh, <laughs> whenever my wife would go away, or go, if I had the house to myself for a night, it was paella, pino, and Predator. Oh, nice! <laughs> so I get a bottle of pino, make a paella, and watch Predator. And have a poo. And a poo. <laughs> <laughs> yes. With Peter, <laughs> my friend, I have a neighbour called Peter. <laughs> Peter, 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 Peter. <laughs> Stop inviting me over to watch you pee and poo. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on, Peter. <laughs> watch us have a poo. Have a learn. <laughs> Me wife's gone away. <laughs> She's away again, isn't she? Yeah. <laughs> As I sat on the bog eating my pie, drinking my pino, <laughs> and having it. Because <laughs> our, our downstairs toilet, like if you were to open the door <laughs> and the front door of the house, you could sit and look out into the street. Oh, so, uh, I love the yeah. idea of a man doomed by alliteration to watch you shit. <laughs> what, what does that even mean? <laughs> Doomed by alliteration. <laughs> yeah. You know, there's a man called Paul who lives down the street. No, no. no. <laughs> Rob Peter to pay Paul whilst pooing by <laughs> 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 Quality OC of our early broadcasting. <laughs> Ooh, oh, fuck a duck. Oh jeez, yeah. Look, no, look. Poor Peter or Paul. What you... I, I tell you what, I do or really bad at is like it's like. Oh, I've got some time. I could watch and film. No, what I'll do is I'll start and film. I'll watch a third of twenty YouTube videos, then start and other film, and then not play six games, and then go to bed really unsatisfied. So I get to the menu yeah, no, screen of a that. bunch of stuff, and then go like, oh. Uh, uh, uh. I have to kind of force myself because I have done it occasionally. I'm I, I'm of the mind and I'm I'm self aware enough to put down my phone, my iPad, everything, all the other distractions, and just put a film on. I did it with Blade Runner, which I was remar- I was surprised, and I wasn't drunk, and I watched the whole thing beginning to end, uh, and really enjoyed it. Uh, having listened to a podcast that was all about it, that kind of explained a lot of shit to me, that I was like, huh. Yeah. So I watched it again. And I was like, huh, I really appreciated it. I won't be doing that. <laughs> I watched, but it was. Fun. I watched Disney Pixar's Inside Out the other night. I watched it on a flight to Peru six years ago, and I was really. We you know uh, last week, everybody, when we were really fried. The end of the fried week is kind of like, oh, do you know what? Let's just watch a gentle cartoon about growing mm. up. I did that, and I basically watched it all and just sat there like a zombie, just like glazed over, pointing my face in the right direction, i.e., at the television. With my ears yeah, I don't really open. have those sort of hungover Sunday mornings anymore. Mm. You know, where you would just put on whatever and sit there in your filth. <laughs> I don't. I, um, I don't have that anymore because I can't. I have no. I, there's. There is no point in getting. I can't get drunk of a night really because I have to get up. Whatever happens, I am going to be up at seven o'clock the next morning, regardless, because my daughter's going to be up and that's it. So. Yeah, it's sort of it's, that's all gone by the wayside. Uh, Although I have to say, I do quite like Daddy Daughter days because basically, um, you know, we'll go for a walk or something. But then it's uh, James Bond in the afternoon. <laughs> so, so. Okay, uh, a couple of super chats. Super chat. Mark Flanaganaganagan sends five US dollar redos and says, "Do these adaptations suggest to you a rich local film culture, not dependent on the world market or something less optimistic?" Uh, no, yeah. So the success or the success of these adaptations uh, does that suggest that we have a good homegrown film situation going on that doesn't require, you know, success abroad? Because like, I think the thing is with the so when you make the, like the In Betweeners movie or the Partridge movie, they don't cost a great deal, um, and they're always they're, they're almost guaranteed. Like for for like the In Betweeners film to flop would have been really unlikely i think they came at right at just about the right time and that's nice i think mm. when these are good that's a really good thing and they're not very expensive 
And that's the kind of, you know, something like the, the in-betweeners film or the Partridge film by British film standards as an island, you know, literally and figuratively, that's like the Avengers, isn't it, for British film to have like the, the in-betweeners <laughs> well, or something. Yeah. Um, and yeah. then... I'd say James Bond is more... Yeah, but it's not <laughs> but British yeah. though, really, is it? Not really, it's, no. I mean, because like, even you know, Harry Potter isn't either. It's Warner Brothers. Yeah. You know, even though Legion and stuff and a lot of British crew, and but, you know, in terms of what we actually make here, because there are tons and 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 tons of British film about social privation, racial tension, the post-war, like you know, the all really worthy, the troubles. the troubles, all these really worthy, yeah. interesting films, tons of them. But in terms of what's British and gets a broad release, you know, 28 Days Later, that was made by Fox. You know, really. Mm. You know what I mean, they're not really... So something such as... Because something made by BBC Films, such as Alan Partridge, it, with Working Tight, and you're Working Tight and stuff like that, they, they are kind of high end for us and they do well because they don't tend to cost a hell of a lot and mm. there's a that you know these are very good examples because we, we've talked often about things that fail to exploit their inbuilt audience um because they don't know who they're aimed at these are things mm. that are very good at exploiting their uh their inbuilt audience i think mm. you know because again when the in, the in between this movie came out at just the right time everyone was ready for it was primed for it and um then it's so it made money you know but relative to probably what 15 to 35 year olds people in britain going out to sit on a friday night it's that thing they like from tv so probably yeah yeah. i thought that was a very successful adaptation actually i I think that i yeah worked really well it really it really does i really think it because because you're broadening the scope because they're going on holiday on a teen holiday to was it ibiza or whatever mm. and it sort of broadens the because that's broadening and we're broadening into a film as well. And it's what they would do. A- it's exactly what they would do. They would go on a shit. They would go on a shit boys' holiday, and it would be a fucking disaster. It's exactly what those yeah. characters would do. It completely makes sense. Yeah, because then then the second one goes to Australia or something, and it's like that. Yeah, the second one has its moments, but it just didn't work for me. It didn't work for me. Mm. It had it had a few bits. It just didn't work, and it feels like it doesn't mm. feel like anybody wants to be there. It feels like a stretch. They didn't need to do it. I think they did everything they needed to do. Because they all get girlfriends at the end of, this, of the first one. And that's the thing with in between is They're not the people... They're not like Mark and Jeremy from Peep Show who who are doomed to be in each other's company for all time and just be constantly tragic. The in-betweeners... I think the reason they're called in-betweeners is because they're, they're too geeky to be cool but too cool to be geeky. Well, they're also at an in-between stage of life, I think, as well. Isn't that the point? So we're not supposed to witness them... They're in a transitional period because they're going into like um university age aren't they yeah isn't that the idea? But I, th- I think that i i understand they called it that because that they're between these social stratas because they're not yeah just, the, yeah but well, it works yeah it works like, but, it but on multiple works. levels yeah. yeah we can both have our cake <laughs> a delicious cake everyone's a winner uh the wing kong exchange sorry i must say before i forget said five puns and says sorry guys really need to say that chocolate oranges are available from rawlins i very often say i very very often say the phrase there's superficial damage to the outer packaging. It's, it's one of my favourite things to say. Whenever I see a chocolate orange, I say there's superficial damage to the outer packaging. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah. yeah. I, uh, as Dan Larson rightly points out, the British sitcom to film tradition was always the go on holiday. Yeah, I mean, that was like the Are You Being Served movie and stuff was that. Um, didn't... Um... I don't think it was a film, but didn't Only Fools and Horses do something like that? They went on holiday. Well, there's one... <laughs> there's Only Fools where they go on holiday to a resort, and in order to get the deal they've got, Dell has told them that Rodney's his son and he's 13. Because <laughs> if you haven't seen it, Rodney's very tall and thin, and he's supposed to be like 20 or 18 or something. So, because they've gone on this holiday, Rodney has to like dress like a child and go to all the activities in order for them to keep the holiday. And I think he like wins a talent show or something. I can't remember. It's great. Because that's that. So, that one. So, the, did you remember the Only Fools when they went to Miami? No, I didn't really watch it. Really. Right. Well, there's an Only Fools when they go to Miami, and then it turns out that. Uh, Del Boy is the exact double of like a local mob boss. And right. that's a bit like, okay, this is getting a bit high concept kind of. And I think mm. it was shot on film as well. You know, in that kind of outside broadcast or outside production where they shot on film. It wasn't like fucking Super 35 or anything. Um, yeah. But yeah, th- that's all a bit kind of like, okay, this feels a bit like a movie premise. And this is about dodgy market traders from Peckham. Let's not get <laughs> yeah. carried away. 
they were oh Miami twice it's called uh that, that episode but uh yeah two part special maybe twice this yeah uh yeah fucking hell uh james atkinson Miami twice is an only films and horses movie is it's like an only films movie in that it's pretty bad okay yeah i watched it when i was a kid i don't think i've ever seen that one i've never seen the Miami twice one again i don't think but i remember the one on holiday where they have to pretend it... oh that's <laughs> That's it. Sorry, Duncan. You just—I don't watch that. What you talk about? As as, as Mr. HGC is pointed out, that's how Rodney Rodney comes second in a skateboarding competition. <laughs> it's so good because he's just robbed of his dignity, and he thought he was going on holiday, but in order for his brother to have a holiday, he has to pretend to be a child. It's fucking. It's brilliant. <laughs> it's good. I really liked Only Fools. I think like Jim yeah, Jim no, Broadbent I... was in Only Fools and Horses, and also it's just, it's crazy. Mm. One of the Driscoll brothers. Um. I, yeah. I feel like I'm missing out on Dairy Girls. You think on Channel Four about the girls in Ireland? Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I've caught a bit of it. I don't know. I don't know. No. Is it good? Well, people seem to really like it, and I'm wondering if I'm missing a trick. There's a one. I'd say De- Declan uh, Lowney, who, who directed Ralph Papa, <clears throat> he's he's directing a thing that's called like oh, I can't remember it's called like Irish Somebody that's coming out on Channel Four. Um, mm. since we've got a little yeah here we go people in the chat saying Derry Girls is really good Derry Girls is basically Irish in between us it's really good says Fremantle Dan Lyles Dan- Derry Girls is really good Steve Allen Derry Girls is very funny um, I, yeah I need to get on Derry Girls then that's what mm. I do because I've heard it's good I've heard good things I do love the in between us there's something, something so good I think it, yeah. it's very 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 accurate to what sort of teenage suburban teenage boys are like um, yeah, yeah. No, I, I was. Um, I, I again, that was one of those ones. Came <clears> late. <throat> I came late to the party on, um, but um, thought was yeah. Because and in a way, I'm kind of glad I did, because um, I, you know, it was like I got to Hoover it all up. Really, what's the one? Isn't there one where they go to the? They go to a um, field trip. Then they go to like uh, theme park or whatever. It's when they go to and, yeah. It's when they go to Thorpe Park. It's, that's it's right. amazing. It's so, so you, you inconsiderate <laughs> bastards. And it's the disabled kids trying to get on the Nemesis Inferno. And it's so oh, about right. Will. Will is constantly because uh, Will. It turns out Will's like a, a, a roller coaster nerd. So he says <laughs> it's the longest track in Europe or whatever. It's like. <laughs> I met because I met and um, hung out with uh, Emily Head. Is it who plays? Oh, uh, Carly D'Amato. She because she's Anthony yeah. Stewart Head's. Anthony Stewart Head played Will's dad in the movie, didn't he? Oh, did he? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Briefly at the start of the movie. So that's kind of nice. All ah, right, yeah. No, she was in. She was in Emmerdale when I was doing Emmerdale. So um, ah. look, she, she's really lovely. Yeah, uh, because <laughs> you have it. There's a cast green room where you all sit and have lunch and stuff. So we're all sort of chatting away. And, I didn't have any scenes with her, but she was really nice. <laughs> poor that poor character. She plays it so well because she just has to constantly react to this. This is when when uh, Simon's bollock is poking out of the thing at the fashion show. Do you remember that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is the fact, the one when they go on the field trip with the Irish girl in it, and they go rent a boat, and Neil goes in the water, and he has to punch the fish to death, and he says, "Can't we call the sea, please?" It's, it's, so, it's so fucking good. It's so good. Um, Frank's got to go. Oh, Frank. Go, Frank. Well, Frank uh, yeah, sorry to text you back, man. Send me a send me a Facebook messenger message, Frank. Do that. We'll set up a mm. set up a let's play. When will we? What time are we going to call it? Time. Uh, let us play. You will be on all night. No. Um, <laughs> let's wrap up. Uh, wrap up in like ten minutes. That's okay. Yeah. 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 Wrap up twenty percent. Oh, hello. I've to, yeah, I've to, fucking did like ten o'clock on a Thursday night. I'm getting texts about work. Uh, mate, I my I have to put my phone down. Like this week, especially as you know, has been rather stressful in terms of clients. Um, I have clients in Australia, uh, Mexico, and the US, and it's like obviously I try and do my work during the work day, but Australia is is awake at either end of the day because they're 11 hours ahead of us so it's like in the evening it's tomorrow morning for them and then in the morning it's that evening so i can be bugged by them like but at least they're asleep during most of my working day but then um 
so I tend to I tend to get kind of double teamed by Australia, <laughs> and then um, and ends. then yeah, America kind of wakes up around <laughs> about lunchtime, so I then get grief. Well, not grief, but you know, it's like I get bombarded, uh, and Mexico in fairly short order. So it's yeah, it's like I do, I am getting to the stage now where it's just like constantly fielding staff, and then whenever they have kind of crises <clears> and and everything, it's like. Ugh. Feel like some sort of yeah, I don't know, counselor <laughs> that I have to kind of <laughs> sort out. So yes, it's been a it's been a knackering week. So I think yeah, I, I mean like I got in bed the last few nights. I've been getting in bed and just like getting hit with emails and WhatsApps and that sounds all sorts exhausting. Of shit. And I'm trying to go to sleep and then like one hands off to the other and it's just like, oh, God, you know. but it's good. I mean it's the it's being busy, isn't it? But it's sort of like. Ugh. Yeah, well, you know, hey, I think the the, the I'm, I'm getting t- I just got I just got told that a shoot's been moved back back a week, but I'm now in a position where I can say I'm doing shoots again. I think I've been on a shoot a week for about a month, which is way look how it used to sort of be. Um, mm. So that's fucking good. <laughs> I'm not I'm not sniffing it. Much. Yeah. Uh, do remember, uh, ladies, gentlemen, and those of you who do not conform to conventional gender binaries, that I will be on the internet tomorrow. I'm on the internet every day, wanking mostly. But not on a camera. Tomorrow I won't be waking on a camera. I'll be talking on a camera for the private watch party on Patreon uh, for the $5 tier and up. So if you're on that, uh, I'll see you tomorrow night from 7. We'll be on about two hours or however long the film is. Uh, it will be a film that's on YouTube that we'll put into a, a virtual hat from which I will take a name. Um, and we'll watch one of your choices of films. They're always good fun, the old uh, private watch parties. So uh, that will be happening tomorrow evening so we're back very good yeah that's, ex- yeah. that's exciting that's exciting <laughs> yeah so i don't want to be I've, i'm farting it's that registering on the mic i was, I was gonna say was that you yeah, it's me. I, you could have passed that off as the chair yeah, i've done it it's, i feel you should own these things you know what i mean because if you don't some of the comments are gonna be like ha ha i farted but if you get in front of it and go no ha 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 i farted you see, I don't know what the value is. That I, I, I just feel like it has more spiritual value. I don't know. Uh, my dad's off to bed. He says so. Good night, oh, Dad. See you, um, I'm off soon too. I'm so tired. No, fair um, yeah. <laughs> when Kong Exchange says, "Yeah, it registered." <laughs> <laughs> see, best I own it now, motherfucker. That's what I say. Oh. It's just let off in a tax inspector. <laughs> yeah, it's a small but potent gust. Um, did you before we get off? Have you seen Mindhorn? No, I have it actually on Blu-ray. Ah, right. Um, oh yeah, no, it, it's on uh, Prime. It's you'd like it. It's Coogan's in it. Um, hmm. Not that it matters. It's it's very kind of uh, it's similar humour to uh, to to Partridge, but you know it's a great you know what it's a great one and done British comedy film that's not based on anything. Um, okay. It's really, really funny, man. It's yeah, you'd like it, I think. Uh, yeah, great, great movie. Look <laughs> uh, But I just reminded earlier because when I had Alf Papa in the background when I was working, it said like watch Mindhorn next, and I was like, oh yeah, fucking Mindhorn's great. I need to, need to bring that up tonight. Oh, I forgot to say, fucking hell, I watched the new Mortal Kombat. Oh yeah. Yeah, and I was really, really, really surprised uh, to find out that I was right and it was shit. And that's sarcasm. It was shit. Like what a shocker. Um, yeah, it was kind of dreadful. Uh, so this is not a joke. A surprising amount of the new Mortal Kombat film takes place in Gary, Indiana. Um, when when it's a film about a transdimensional fighting tournament among immortal super beings and monsters, Gary, Indiana. I mean, that's like. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like. It's like, I don't know. They're not immune to tax breaks. <laughs> yeah, yes, exactly. Well, if you told me the new He-Man film was 70% of it was in Chepstow, I'd be like, oh, that's, <laughs> which essentially is what the old He-Man film is really, isn't it? Um, yeah, yeah. But, or the He-Man film. <laughs> yeah. It's, it, it was very small. It felt very... Because the trailers and stuff made it look like it was going to be this big thing. It's going to be like, oh, we might have a fun kind of Mortal Kombat movie. It had some moments, certainly... But it's mostly about seven to nine people standing in three locations, and it doesn't even have a yeah. fighting tournament in it. <laughs> it's like, right. well, this is the fucking this fucking of it. Like, okay, like it's like, like say what you like about the Death Race remake, it's got a fucking Death Race in it. Like, it's, yeah. it's, the, it's the bare minimum remit. Um, the guy who, <laughs> it meets minimum standard. Yes, minimum standard. It's like you know, it, it's like what the minimum standard is supposed to be considered meat. 
You know, there's a lot of Rusk. <laughs> Gary Indiana represents the Rusk of the Mortal Kombat film. <laughs> um, but it's, it's yeah, I just thought... The guy who bars is very pointed. The guy who plays Kano is great. Wacky Australian mm. guy. Really good. But it was just kind of like, yeah, this is this just feels really small. And, and it takes itself really quite seriously when it has no business doing that. Because, you know, it's literally got a reptile monster in it and a four-armed guy. And, um, <laughs> Gary Indiana. So much Gary Indiana. And so, so much Gary Indiana. It was unreal. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to think if I've watched anything of note recently. Not. Oh, uh, bugged up. Started watching that Mayor of whatever with Kate Winslet in it. Um, that's on. Is it on now or on? I, I, I can't remember what that is. I'm not even nervous. So this is det- yet another detective show. Um, well, she's a mayor. She's a detective. No, no, she's called Ma- Mayor as in Mary. I think. Oh, like she's a, right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> she's a detective. She's a mayor and a detective. Well, I don't know because it's yeah. like murder she wrote or something. You know what I mean? She's a You can be a there too. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah. No, it was. It, it's all right. It's fine. I'm trying to think. I, I'm just getting a bit punch drunk. I think with all the, like the television. I I want to kind of get back out and make it again. I mean, I'm hoping that things are going to start cranking into gear soon with all that. Um, well, it seems to know. be coming back to life a bit. I mean, from my like I said, for my part, from at least from the videography side of stuff, it's not really film and TV, is it? But like that started to come back to life slowly. Mm. Um, yeah, Brad stopped in. Um, the other weekend on his way up to York um, and I think I spent most of the time telling him I don't care <laughs> <laughs> I don't give a shit fuck it I don't give a shit <laughs> not him no not, not as in I don't care about him but as in like I was just like well if it happens it happens but I'm like yeah. no no how, I want it to happen now <laughs> but I'm lined up to do stuff it's just it needs to you know start really yeah, he will. There you go. He will. We'll get there. We'll get there. We've got a few things lined up, but um, yeah. of course, Type G Bleed is is the. It's the... going to be the movie event of the decades. The, the appetizer on the uh, yeah. the on the entree. The movie of event the... of the decade, by which I mean a fifteen-minute film that you only go you have to, able to see in festivals. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 if they accept it, <laughs> movie event of the decade. It's definitely yeah. the movie event of my cloud ser- of, of my home server because it's like nearly two terabytes, which is Jeez. Yeah, because well, I shot uncompressed 4K DCI. It wasn't right. Raw. Yeah, I had to go out and buy a fucking drive. There, there's the backup. I had to go and buy a fucking two terabyte drive to back it up on. So it's just like, what if my house gets struck by lightning or Cambridge has the first flood for 200 years? Um, <laughs> so yeah. it'll be fine. It's coming along nicely. It's coming along a pace. I would say I've been using the word a pace this week. Well, that's not a word, Excellent. is it? Is it a word? Is it two words? Coming along a pace. Uh, a pace is a word, yeah. One word. Uh, a pace. That's weird. A pace. A pace. <laughs> no, a pace is a, a pace. word, yes. Yeah, I'm not going mad. Okay, yeah, I'll be saying a pace a lot. <laughs> Though apparently I was unsure if it was a word. Is that real? <laughs> if it's real. No. Steve Allen was asking about my allergies because I'm sniffing like a fucker. The window's open. It is spring. I think it's safe to assume mm-hmm. that pollen is going up my quite sizable hooter. And, and, and causing <laughs> sniffles. It doesn't really feel like spring at the moment. I have to say, it's freaking freezing now. So yeah, we had a really nice like last week. I think whatever it was last week, I was walking around in shorts and a t-shirt, and then mm-hmm. that is over. Today, the, the test for someone such as myself is you go outside and it's like, is my head cold? And it's like, <laughs> uh, yeah, we're getting a hat on today, boys. It's, it's a chilly one. Right, after I got my hair cut, I had to go somewhere and I got out of the car and I was just like, oh. Like, yeah, you, really that cold. thing when you hit the street with the short back and sides, you just kind of like, ha 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 ha, it's like jumping <laughs> yeah. in a cold swimming pool or something. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's, uh, should we wrap up? I think it's it's about that time. Uh, yeah. Thank you for coming, guys, for the the Partridge Watch Party. We'll go. We'll try and get back to something a bit more conventional next week, I guess. It's been a little run of comedy. We're going to go a bit more bait. We're going to go a bit more bait, I'm afraid. Predator, uh, predators, <laughs> predators. And the no. predator again. Um, yeah, no, we'll go. Well, do you know what, guys? We've got some suggestions. Maybe we'll, we'll do a round of suggestions for the watch party. Um, mm. but yeah. <clears throat> okay, well, we're going to get to credits. I've just updated the credits today. So if you're looking for your name in lights, you're going to see that just about now. So uh, we're going to sign off. Any, any final words? Stay in school.
funny hair. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, no, that's more funny. <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, I don't know where I was. At, but do, if you are gay, uh, do rubber rubs. <laughs> was it statistically one in three of you are? Or something? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. One in four of you is gay. <laughs> right, we're off. Take care, everyone. Bye bye.